The World Sec Parliament, which is a parliament of the Sec nation that was formed following a decision of the Sarbat Khalsa, the gathering of the Sec nation in 2015. So the World Sec Parliament has become, in effect, the representative body that addresses the rights, aspirations, concerns, anxieties, wishes of the Sec nation on the global scale. So we engage with the United Nations, we engage with member states of the United Nations, we engage with NGOs, we engage with other nations, many of which are represented here today. And we seek common ground. And the common ground that we seek is a common ground based on human rights. It's a common ground based on international law and on peace and a just world order. Sikhism teaches us about individual, personal, spiritual salvation. But under the Miri Piri concept, spiritual and temporal, under the Miri Piri concept, the Sikhs are required to go beyond the personal spiritual realm and we are required to go into the world and to help bring about a just world order where the rights of everybody all nations all religions men and women the rights of everybody are respected and an egalitarian society can function doesn't matter whichever part of the world, we will take these values forward. And the Sikhs rejected Guru Nanak Dev Ji. This year marks the 550th anniversary of his birth. Guru Nanak Dev Ji rejected the caste system. And the Sikhs ever since have been the target of those who promote the caste system. Because of this egalitarian philosophy, we will pursue human rights. And before I actually get into the conference agenda per se, there's a very, very important um, point that I'd like to reach, which is the recognition of the spectacularly good services to the Sikhs from a non-Sikh Dr. Iktidar Jima, himself a Muslim, has taken it upon himself to talk about Sikhism, to talk about Sikh philosophy, to protect Sikh human rights, to endorse our call for self-determination. As a non-Sikh to do this, we are very grateful to him. We are humbled by the fact that a man who is of very high office himself, he is an advisor to the United Nations on the issue of the prevention of genocide and atrocity crimes. So a man who is recognized not just by us, the Sikhs, a man who is recognized by the international community, by the United Nations itself, has performed services, one of which I'm going to mention today, and he has come with a gift related to that. So, Dr. Jima, here by my side, took part in a UN convention that deals with the question of faith how does faith relate to rights? How do you relate faith and religion to the concept of rights? And the point is, as Dr. Saab has shown, as I'll come on to, to mention, it is inextricably linked. The question of faith, belief, it's inextricably linked 
with the question of rights and human rights. So Dr. Zab took part in this conference in March 2017 and he brought about the inclusion in the resulting document of that United Nations Convention, he brought about the inclusion of several couplets from the Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji. Maharaj Diya, Gurbani Diya, Tukha, as United Nations Declaration of which Darja Hoiya Pali Wari in history. And this has been done by a, a non, as I say, a non sec So we are deeply grateful for that. Uh, Dr. Saab has brought with him today a presentation which he's gifted to the World Sec Parliament of the relevant Garbani couplets that speak about Halemi Raj, a just order. And this is Rob's, this is, this is a command that's not made by any man. This is a command, this just order that we are seeking. This is a command from Mirwan, from God himself. Secondly, there is a couplet here referring to the role of women and the respect we have as a religion for women. How can you criticize women? They give birth to kings. How on earth can we see women as a lesser being than man? The last one referred to here, the, the last couplet, refers to the fact that a God-centric person whose thinking is aligned with God, with Maharaj, Waheguru, Allah, God, whichever word you wish to use, the God-centric person is a person that sees God in everybody, that sees everybody as equal, as alike. So these are pearls of wisdom taken from our scriptures, the Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib, which Dr. Sahib has brought into a United Nations Declaration for the first time ever. He's presenting us with a memento of those couplets taken from the UN doc uh, document. And so we are extremely grateful to Dr. Saab. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, express my gratitude to Dr. Saab personally, but I'm sure everybody in this chamber today would want to join me and show our appreciation. Thank you, Dr. Saab. <laughs> We are uh, humbled by his contribution, but we are also uh, hoping to mark this occasion by, give, by presenting some gifts of our own to uh, Dr. Chima. Uh, Manpreet Singh of the World Sec Parliament, coordinator of the World Sec Parliament, would just like to say a few words about the nature of this award, which is very pertinent to everything that I've just said about Dr. Chima. Well, thank you very much for everybody to be here, first of all. Uh, the reason when, when we saw his contributions to the Sikh nation and as a non-Sikh what he's done for Sikhism we were just finding a way how we need to thank him and there's only one personality that comes into our mind was Sai Mia Mirji Sai Mia Mirji who laid the foundation of Darbar Sahib and we thought that as a part representing Sikh nation as World Sikh Parliament, the best we can do for him is to give him a Sai Mi Amir Award. So please, uh, I think, let's all applaud this. Manpi Singh mentioned uh, that Sai Mi Amir was invited by our fifth Guru, Guru Arjun Dev Ji, to, to lay the foundation of Darbar Sahib, Amritsar, sometimes referred to as the Golden Temple and as part of our appreciation the World Set Parliament would like to present okay. uh, a photograph of the Darbar Sahib and in 
reference to the Miri Piri concept, our friends at the Sikh Museum in Derby have brought along a memento from their museum, a fantastic collection of artifacts from Sikh history, which is a canon um, which reflects the state that the Sikhs had in Punjab before British annexation. So, Dr. Saab, uh, once again, from everybody in this room, thank you very much. So, with that, I'd like to move on. We've got, a, a, as I say, a long list of speakers. Um, two keynote speakers. Um, Dr. Chima himself, because of his role as an advisor to the United Nations on the prevention of genocide and atrocity crimes, it's obviously fundamentally relevant to the issue that we have today. The threat of war, of catastrophic war in South Asia. Not just Punjab, but Kashmir and other regions is something that is clearly within the atrocity crimes scenario. So without further ado, Dr. Saab, um, I'm going to pass on to you if you could make your contribution today. Thank you. Bye, Guruji ka khalsa. I know it's a council house, but Fateh, wherever is contributed, should be loud enough to contribute. So once more, Vai Guru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vai Guru Ji Ki Fateh. I'm greatly honored and humbled, and um, it was indeed a surprise. Um, I came to contribute reflections on the topic, but it's very kind of the Sikh community, which is my own community and by the World Sikh Parliament to acknowledge. Um, I, I don't think I have rendered any services because Guru Granth Sahib Ji is not only Sikh Guru. It has Farid in it, it has Pakna in it, and it has Kabir in it. So it is our common heritage. And it was recognized as such in the past as well. Um, before partition, I've heard from my ancestors, people always used to say, Baba Nanak Shah Fakir, Sikhan the Guru, Musliman the Peer. And wherever in the history we walk, Muslims always walked with the Sikhs. Whether it was Pai Mardana with Guru Nanak, whether it was Sai Mia Mir with Guru Arjun, whether it was Nabi Khan and Ghani Khan with the Guru Gobind Singh Ji, wherever Muslims were always side by side with the Sikhs. Um, I would not like to deviate from the topic because the problem with the, with the people who can speak is they can deviate very easily uh, from the topics. Um, when it comes to this conference and when it comes to this, these three angs and toks from Guru Granth Sahib, in the way it has been included in the UN Faithful Right Declaration as the first ever part of Guru Granth Sahib being included in a UN Charter, where uh, I got it included, I've given the correspondence to G for authenticity because a lot of people take rights for the things they never did. Uh, one thing was very clear to me. The Sikh nation, if it wants to survive, it has to adopt Miri and Piri. At the moment, it's only Piri, but you have to seek Miri, unless nations without state have no stake on the world forums. When um, we were gathered together at the United Nations to put, because we have a new Secretary General as well now in the UN, to put forward a Faithful Right Declaration, there was no state there to get Guru Granth Sahib in the declaration. Quran was proposed by 52 member Muslim states. You have State of Israel, which will talk about Torah and inclusion in, in the UN Charter. You would have uh, Christian states who would back Bible, but there is nobody in the UN structure as a member state to get Guru Granth Sahib in. I've uh, given uh, Ranjit correspondence, which clearly exhibit that while I was chairing the committee of the draft for this declaration, I said, Sikhism is the fifth largest religion of the world, which seeks for the common humanity. And hence, Guru Granth Sahib should be included in the declaration. Otherwise, it cannot become a universal declaration for faith for rights. But it comes with a big message. For any religion to survive in the world, it has to seek sovereignty. And it is everyone's right. 
United Nations on whose advisory board I am on, it was established by Dumbarton proposal, a proposal well before the UN was established. And the first rule of that proposal was every nation has the right to self-determination. In 1948, when the nations of the world gathered together in San Francisco to establish the United Nations, Article 1 clearly stated the, the purpose to establish UN was to give people right to self-determination. And Sikhs by all means and Kashmiris by all means are a nation by any definition and have the right <coughs> to self-determination. When it comes to South Asia, because our conference was about nuclear flashpoint and about South Asia, we are at the UN and all my colleagues because uh, our Under Secretary General Diamond Yang, who chairs our UN advisory board, he directly reports to Security Council, uh, not to the Secretary General, but to the Security Council. He always asks me that what's happening in this region. It concerns all of us. And someone who knows the history of that very region and of uh, a major majoritarian rule in India, where um, you would find a quote unquote democratic elected prime minister. When she lost it in the court, she imposed emergency in the so-called democracy, which was like a martial law. And then she declared the country secular. And not only she did that, after that when she saw that she's going to lose the election, she attacked Darbar Sahib to win the majoritarian sympathy vote from the majoritarian community. So if that prime minister can use that mentality to victimize a marginalized minority community for the vote bank, the party which rules today is much worse than that. And we have seen that tension ex escalating in the region just for the election politics, where a major majoritarian party or of our religion, which wants to declare all India as a Hindu nationalist state, they tried their best, I think, in the last two, three months to escalate tension and to wage a war. With a, with a neighbor. South Asia is not a region where there are two nuclear states. South Asia is a region where there are three nuclear states, India, China, and Pakistan. And state of India has been in war with both India and China in the past. And in the way it has spread terrorism across the borders while operating from Afghanistan, and 10 years of long war of terror in Pakistan, and now it wants to interfere in CPAC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is supposed to bring prosperity in the region. The only way they can stop it is by waging a war. So it concerns all of us, because in the past also, it was Punjab all the time. Punjabiyat is our common identity. Whether we are Sikhs, whether we are Muslims, we have a shared heritage, like many other nations of the world. Our language, our culture constitute a cultural identity. Look at 1947. Whose genocide was it? Punjabis. Most of the Punjabis were killed, millions of them. And look at the records of the British archives. The, Br the Britain was leaving India in 1948, not in 1947. But who was the one who pushed Lord Mountbatten to quit one year earlier, which resulted into the the massacre of million of Punjabis. That very party is now one of the opposition party in India. Look at 1965. Where war was fought? Who were killed? Punjabis on both sides, in majority. And for the Sikhs, I, I really get worried. People always ask me, you are a Muslim, why you are so much worried about the Sikhs? Because Sikhs lives on the border of three nuclear states. And for, for a state on right or left, it's very easy to drop an atom bomb and finish the Sikh nation forever from its roots where it once lived. It has happened with other nations, and it can happen with the Sikh nation as well. Therefore, I always argue, as, although I have been um, called previously a terrorist sympathizer in the UN, uh, somebody wrote a letter, a lovely member state, 
and I don't need to name that state, you would know, they, said, uh, they sent a letter to the Secretary General that on your advisory board there is a ter terrorist sympathizer who would ask for people's sovereignty and who would ask uh, and support people's right of self-determination. But I always say uh, to my UN colleagues, I support the right of self-determination of Kashmiris, of Sikhs, of Nagas, of seven sister states of the northeast of India because I want peace in the region. Because we need buffer states between these three states which would split and separate the borders of three hostile neighbors who have fought more than four wars with each other. Without having buffer states, you cannot have peace in South Asia. Because these nations are not willing to engage with each other and they are not willing to maintain peace and prosperity in the region. The only solution for the South Asian peace is that you need Khalistan, which would split the borders of India and Pakistan. You need an independent, autonomous Kashmir, which would split the borders of India, Pakistan, and China. Without that, you cannot achieve peace. I may uh, sound like an idiot to you, but this is the only viable solution, and one day, world would have to reach to this conclusion. When it comes to the Sikh sovereignty or anyone's sovereignty, we are not against any nation. Sikh sovereignty doesn't have to come through any militancy. Sikh sovereignty doesn't have to come through any violence. It is embedded in the UN Charter under Article 1, which guarantees that every nation has the right to self-determination and it was Guru Nanak who said, Nanak Raj Chalaya, Sachkut Stani, New Day, New Day. And Guru Gobind Singh, he established Khalsa. I always say to people, that we always celebrate with Sakhi. It's not a season of Mela. It is not a season of eating jalebi and pakore. It is a creation of a nation by a Sikh master. And the reason to establish that Khalsa was for Khalsa to seek sovereignty. Because Raj bina na taram chale hai, taram bina sab dale male. So by all means, we all in a very civic and civilized manner should today pass that the Sikhs have the right to self-determination. And if the peace has to be achieved in the South Asian region, that is only through giving the nations a right of self-determination. The so-called democracy, the largest democracy in the world, should learn from our democracy, our British democracy, where we have given right of self-determination to people of Scotland, where we have given right of self-determination to this own nation to decide the future, whether we want to be in European Union or not. They should look at Canada, who has given people of Montreal a right of self-determination, whether they want to be part of Canada or not. They should look at the Chinese model, who are giving right of self-determination to people of Hong Kong. If the real democracies work that way, India should look at this. But unfortunately, in my assessment, it's a procedural democracy, which get majoritarian rule elected. We discriminate against minorities, not only in day-to-day -day life, but also constitutionally and legally. I would leave some of my, uh, one of my report, which was, uh, which I was asked to write by the United States State Department about the constitutional and legal challenges faced by the religious minorities in India. And in my report, I very clearly mentioned it was published in the Trump administration. So Indians started propagating a Trojan horse in the Trump administration because they <laughs> it surprised them that such a report was published under the uh, newly elected uh, Trump administration. So by all means, if the Sikhs have to survive, it has to seek sovereignty. And we all endorse that. And thank you all. First of all, um, I would like to thank the World Sikh Parliament, especially uh, Ranjit Singh, for actually inviting me um, to talk on this very important, uh, pertinent issue at the moment, um, for dialogue for peace and for trying to get the message out there on an international level. Um, to try to stop the, the sort of rhetoric that is coming out for a potential war between two nuclear armed neighbors, that is India and Pakistan. Now, um, obviously, as, as an academic for many, many years, I've been looking at especially the core issues relating 
to uh, the India's nuclear program as well as Pakistan's nuclear pro program. And I've also uh, been researching a lot on the nuclear non-proliferation regime as a whole and how international community, especially the uh, permanent five members of Security Council, um, sort of try to adhere to these international uh, regimes, which allow for, and I usually say that they sort of uh, monopolize over the idea that who are nuclear weapon states and who are non-nuclear weapon states. And this is quite interesting to see that how they basically are trying to say that yes, we are the nuclear weapon state, whereas anybody who has tested any nuclear weapon uh, you know, after 1967 um, will not be a nuclear weapon state. But we all know that um, since the 1970s, India detonated their first nuclear weapon, uh, which was called a Smiling Buddha. And later on, obviously, Pakistan um, tested their nuclear weapons in the late 1990s. Now, the recent events with regards to Pulwama, as we all know, the Pulwama attacks, have highlighted the fact that these two countries can actually uh, come very close to pressing that button. Um, and by pressing that button, I mean pressing that nuclear button. Now, the problem remains and has always been the same. I mean, since the independence, since both the countries actually got their independence, the problem has always been for them the issue of Kashmir. And many times there have been various skirmishes, there have been many, many conflicts in the 1960s, then in the 1970s, even in 1990s, we had, you know, uh, India actually mobilizing their troops around uh, the borders. So this, uh, obviously, as an academic who looks at the South Asian context, um, I, I try to sort of analyze a lot of areas, not in the past history, but whatever has been happening now ever since. And how do we go about creating a certain solution to this, or bring about a solution to this problem? Now, um, obviously, we have a post-colonial legacy. And um, I was just looking at the drafts for resolution for the World Sikh Parliament, and I very uh, uh, rightly agree with the fourth one, where you were sort of requesting. Uh, and the reason for us to have this conference is to basically request the UK government to, uh, as a permanent uh, you know, member, to raise these issues highlighted, because they were once a part of this whole uh, you know, uh, ordeal that all the South Asians are still going through. Uh, it was, obviously, with the colonial power, was a very chaotic departure. The way that the boundaries were, uh, you know, demarcated, the way they were that left, uh, it was very much cryptic. And I suppose that it, it's very good to actually put this resolution to say that, yes, the reason that why we are here is because we are demanding this. We need to raise these issues that are being highlighted. Um, and how do we go about it? We need to bring these issues on the table, involve all those parties who have their own political aspirations who have their own political rights, whether those are Kashmiris, whether that's Sikh nation, they all have their specific political aspirations. Now the problem with the, both the governments is that they never involve any of these parties. They never bring out the marginalized communities in. So the only thing that they're probably thinking about is their own power structures. How are they actually going to play amongst themselves? So this is a very, very good, I suppose, resolution here. So I think this is, it's very, very important to actually bring all these parties onto the table and talk about the sort of solutions that that these people need because it's a diverse. I mean, if you look at um, you know the Punjab itself, it's a diverse. You look at Kashmir, it's diverse. So all the political you know aspirations of the people need to be taken into consideration. Um, the other most important thing is um, with the with the idea that you know I mean. As an academic who sort of thinks that nuclear war can actually bring about a huge environmental uh, you know, catastrophe, not just on the humanitarian level, but on an environmental level. So the concerns are on both the sides. Um, there are people who um, you know, sort of very much are against the whole you know, sort of rhetoric about you know, what needs to be done about this nuclear sort of uh, you know, uh, 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 rhetoric of war that keeps coming from India and Pakistan all the time. Why is it that this issue is being politicized so much? And as we can see that in India at, the, at that time when Pulwama attacks were taking place, obviously with the elections coming in India, this was very much politicized in a way to basically create this certain uh, a way for Modi that, oh yes, I'm basically, I am doing something for the nation. 
and this is the way that I'll, I'll you know, sort of go about doing that. Basically, I will, if, if it comes to this, we can wage a war. You know, we can have a nuclear war, but not realizing that what catastrophe that can bring. Right? Even if there is that uh, war hysteria. I mean, the idea that yes, we have nuclear weapons, you have nuclear weapons. You know, we just with a push of a button, we can actually, you know, uh, uh, it will be a total annihilation. The, even the idea. I think it's, it's, it's ridiculous for the leaders to actually think about, you know, just that way they can actually possibly use their nuclear weapons for their own politi political gains, for politicizing that issue even more. Um, now, the, the answer, obviously, there is no certain solution. There are many solutions. But obviously, the idea is for us to actually be here, is to talk about these issues, bring them out on the table, create this huge awareness so that people understand where we are. Uh, I always talk about these subaltern vo voices, you know, the subaltern voices that come from all these marginalized communities, from all these groups who have their own aspirations. And I believe that it's very important to actually bring them on the table and try to bring a solution to a problem. Um, there is a very one interesting saying, uh, and I'm, I'm actually going to end with that as well. Um, uh, and Amit Rowan is one of a uh, uh, very well-known author, and he talks about how, what nuclear war, the, what sort of catastrophe these nuclear wars can bring. He talks about that the key of resolving any sort of dispute or any sort of international conflict and when we talk about this, we're talking about these two nuclear-armed countries, India and Pakistan. The only way to resolving this international conflict would be to look for a very viable solution. And within that viable solution, you need to not just come from a power structure within, but you need to recognize that there are marginalized communities, there are certain groups that have their own goals and aspirations that need to be considered. And then finding, trying to find a common ground. Now, obviously, now and again, we've had many peace dialogues between India and Pakistan. Uh, there have been many uh, talks, you know, over the past many sort of years, especially in the 1990s. But every time something had happened, you know, later on, you'd see that you know, they, somehow they have actually been <coughs> left, uh, you know, in, in a loop. So we really need to find a common ground, need to find something, a solution that would have proactive strategies. And it's very important for all of us to have those proactive strategies in hand. And I, I find that with these resolutions, I mean, we can start off with having a certain proactive strategy or bringing about a certain clear idea that we'll put on the table, you know, on the Human Rights Commission. Again, um, using effective negotiation. So without bringing all the parties onto the table, you can't have effective negotiations. So if, if, if the Sikh nation is not being involved, if the Kashmiris are not being involved, then obviously you will never ever have a proactive strategy. At the same time, they will never have any effective um, uh, negotiation. So the negotiation and communication is very important. They need to understand what is that, 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 that you know, what are the aspirations that are required and how do we actually bring them into a proactive strategy and bring them into place. Um, and then again, appreciating different cultural differences, you know. It, they, like I said, it's, there's, it's, there's diversity out there. And we need to understand that with the, the beauty about diversity is to actually appreciate it and look into the, the, uh, the beauty of how, you know, you can actually integrate this. And I think this is the only way that, that a solution can be put With regards, I mean, there have been many sort of other narratives that have been brought forward. I was, I'm actually working on writing a book at the moment, and one of the areas that I'm focusing on is actually that we as people, you know, uh, as various communities, we're sick and tired of the same rhetoric that keeps coming from these countries. You know, and, and every other like five, ten years, we see that there's some sort of a, you know, a war is hanging there or some sort of a conflict is there. And I think what we need to do is, again, we need to change and look at the narrative. We need to bring these groups on the talks. That's what's not happening. We are not being involved. You are not being involved. So these, these issues are being kept under the bag. And hence, that is what is creating more problems. And these are the concerns for all of us, you know, for all the Kashmiris, for all the Sikhs. And I'm not just talking about, I'm also talking about so many other marginalized communities. So, so they, they need to actually be brought into the whole process of a dialogue 
of, of, of peacemaking to understand what exactly they want. And the reason that we are doing all this is to actually create that international awareness that yes, we have people here who are very much concerned about this. And we need to take these concerns at an international level and put them into human rights, uh, United Nations human rights. <coughs> Thank you very much. Very grateful to uh, Dr. Annie Wakar, uh, clearly an expert on, on the region. What struck me in particular was the, the emphasis that she put on including those nations, those groups that are currently not at the table. So whether it's resolving the underlying struggle for self-determination in Kashmir or in Punjab, whether it's eliminating the risk of catastrophic war in that region, we are the stakeholders. How can it be that the, the stakeholders themselves are not at the table? It's a, it's a hugely important point, which is being completely missed by the narrative, as you say, uh, Dr. Wakar, the narrative that is being pushed by those in power. We need to break that narrative, and hopefully this conference will contribute towards that process. Wahiguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Wahiguru Ji Ki Fateh. जिस तरह आप जी ਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਆਪਾਂ ਚਿੰਤਤ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਜੇ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਦੀ ਨਿਊਕਲੀਅਰ ਦੀ ਲੜਾਈ ਲੱਗ ਗਈ ਤਾਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਗਣਤੀ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਸਭ ਤੋਂ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਨੁਕਸਾਨ ਹੋਵੇਗਾ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਲੜਾਈ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਮਸਲਾ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਮਰਜੀ ਹੋਵੇ ਲੜਾਈ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਚ ਲੜੇ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਵੀ ਸਾਦੀ ਉਹ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਦਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਸਾਦੀ ਉਹ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਦਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਬਾਹਰ ਬੈਠਿਆਂ ਦੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਮੇਵਾਰੀ ਬਣਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਆਪਾਂ ਆਪਣੇ ਭਾਈਚਾਰੇ ਦੀ ਆਪਣੀ ਕੌਮ ਦੀ ਆਪਣੇ ਇਲਾਕੇ ਦੀ ਜਿੱਥੋਂ ਆਪਾਂ ਆਏ ਹਾਂ ਬਿਸ਼ੱਕ ਦੀ ਉਧਰਲਾ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਹੋਵੇ ਬਿਸ਼ੱਕ ਦੀ ਉਧਰਲਾ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਹੋਵੇ ਦੋਨਾਂ ਲਈ ਆਪਣੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਮੇਵਾਰੀ ਬਣਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਉੱਥੇ ਪੀਸ ਰਵੇ ਤੇ ਉੱਥੇ ਨਿਊਕਲੀਅਰ ਬੋਰ ਨਾ ਕਦੇ ਵੀ ਹੋਵੇ ਤੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਕੌਮ ਦਾ ਆਪਣੇ ਭਾਈਚਾਰੇ ਦਾ ਆਪਣੇ ਗੋਂਡੀਆਂ ਦਾ ਨੁਕਸਾਨ ਨਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਇਹ ਚਾਲ ਜੀ ਰਹੀ ਮੈਸੇਜ ਹੈ ਕਾਲਤਾ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜਸੇਦਾਰ ਜਗਤਾਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਹਵਾਰਾ ਦੇ ਵਕੀਲ ਐਡਵੋਕੇਟ ਅਮਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਚਾਲ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਕਾਨਫਰੰਸ ਨੂੰ ਖਾਸ ਸੰਦੇਸ਼ ਸ਼ਾਇਦ ਹਾਜ਼ਰ ਡੈਲੀਗੇਟਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਮਾਲੂਮ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੋਵੇਗਾ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖ ਕੌਮ ਕਿੰਨੀ ਬੇਬਸੀ ਮਹਿਸੂਸ ਕਰਦੀ ਹੋਵੇਗੀ ਜਿਸ ਦਾ ਹੋਮਲੈਂਡ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਭਾਰਤ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਸਿਰ ਮੈਦਾਨ ਜਾਂ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਬਲਕੇ ਧਾਨਕ ਜੰਗ ਦਾ ਵੀ ਮੁੱਖ ਸ਼ਿਕਾਰ ਹੋ ਸਕਦੀ ਹੈ ਬੇਸ਼ਾ ਦਾ ਦਾਨ ਕੋ ਲੜਾਈ ਦਾ ਸਾਰ ਸਾਰੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਵਿੱਚ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਨੂੰ ਚੜਨਾ ਪਵੇਗਾ ਫਿਰ ਵੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਬੈਠੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਬਾਹਰ ਬੈਠੇ ਸਿੱਖ ਮੁਸਲਮਾਨਾਂ ਤੇ ਸਾਈ ਭੈਣਾਂ ਭਰਾਵਾਂ ਦੇ ਤਹਿ ਦਿਲੋਂ ਧੰਨਵਾਦੀ ਹਾਂ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੇ ਇਸ ਖਤਰੇ ਨੂੰ ਸਮਝ ਕੇ ਸੁਣ ਰੋਕਣ ਲਈ ਕਾਨਫਰੰਸ ਨੂੰ ਲੀਕ ਕੇ ਜੋ ਕਦਮ ਉਠਾਏ ਹਨ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਤੇ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਸਿੱਖ ਕੌਮ ਦੀ ਬਦਕਿਸਮਤੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਇਸ ਨੂੰ ਬਾਰ ਬਾਰ ਆਪਣੀ ਇਸ ਬੇਬਸੀ ਨੂੰ ਸਿੱਖ ਰਾਜ ਖੋਂਜ ਜਾਣ ਪਿੱਛੋਂ ਮਹਿਸੂਸ ਕਰਨਾ ਪਿਆ ਪੈ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਜਲਿਆ ਵਾਲਾ ਬਾਗ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦਾ ਬਟਵਾਰਾ ਖੂਨੀ 84 ਸਿਰਫ ਇਸ ਬੇਬਸੀ ਦੀਆਂ ਤਿੰਨ ਇਤਿਹਾਸ ਮਸਲਾ ਹੀ ਹਨ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਕੋ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਰਹਿਣ ਤੋਂ ਲਾਵਾ ਵੀ ਸਿੱਖ ਦੀ ਨਸਲ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਜਾਰੀ ਹੈ ਲੇਕਿਨ ਆਧਾਨਿਕ ਜੰਗ ਦੌਰਾਨ ਸਾਰੇ ਦੇ ਸਾਰੇ ਬਿਰਲੀਕ ਪੰਜਾਬੀਆਂ ਦਾ ਸਵਾਇ ਸਫਾਇਆ ਸੰਭਵ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਲਈ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਦਾ ਖੁਦ ਮੁਖਤਿਆਰੀ ਸ਼ਰਾਰਤ ਹਮੇਸ਼ਾ ਜਾਰੀ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਉੱਥੇ ਜਾਂ ਸਿੱਖ ਰਾਜ ਸਰਬੱਤ ਦੇ ਭਲੇ ਵਿੱਚੀ ਹੈ ਜੋ ਆਧਾਨਿਕ ਜੰਗ ਤਾਂ ਕੀ ਮੈਦਾਨੀ ਜੰਗ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਰੋਕਣ ਦਾ ਆਧਾਰ ਬਣੇਗਾ ਕਮਾਂਤਰੀ ਤਾਕਤਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਸਮੇਂ ਸਿਰ ਇਸ ਉਪਾਅ ਵੱਲ ਖਾਸ ਧਿਆਨ ਦੇਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਹੈ ਵਰਣਾ ਮੋਦੀ ਵਰਗਾ ਭਾਰਤ ਭਾਰਤੀ ਪ੍ਰਧਾਨ ਮੰਤਰੀ ਹਮੇਸ਼ਾ ਹਿੰਦੂ ਰਾਸ਼ਟਰ ਬਣਾਉਣ ਦੀ ਤਾਂਗ ਵਿੱਚ ਤੋਪਾਂ ਚਲਾਉਣ ਲਈ ਆਪਣੇ ਬਿਆਨਾਂ ਮੁਤਾਬਕ ਹੀ ਦੀਵਾਲੀ ਤੱਕ ਵੀ ਲੀਗ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰੇਗਾ ਉਲਟ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਪ੍ਰਧਾਨ ਮੰਤਰੀ ਇਮਰਾਨ ਖਾਨ ਇਤਨੇ ਦਿਲੇ ਤੇ ਸੂਝਵਾਨ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਤਾਂ ਹਾਲਤ ਅੱਜ ਨਾਲੋਂ ਵੀ ਕਿਤੇ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਵਿਗੜ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਕਰਤਾਰ
ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਪ੍ਰਵਾਨ ਜੁਰਮ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਤਿਆਰੀ ਵੀ ਹੋ ਚੁੱਕੀ ਹੈ ਜੋ ਭਾਰਤ ਵਿੱਚ ਅੰਦਰੂਨੀ ਜੰਗ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਜਨਮ ਦੇ ਸਕਦਾ ਹੈ ਜਿਸ ਦਾ ਹੱਲ ਵੀ ਗਵਾਂਢੀ ਮੁਲਕਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਛੇੜ ਛੇੜ ਛੇੜਛਾੜ ਕਰਨਾ ਹੀ ਹੋਵੇਗਾ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਕਾਫੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਪ੍ਰਸ਼ਾਸਨ ਖੁਦ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਦੀ ਮਰਜ਼ੀ ਨਾਲ ਲੰਘਣਾ ਕਰਕੇ ਹਜ਼ਾਰਾਂ ਨੌਜਵਾਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰ ਅਤੇ ਹਰੂਰ ਅਕ ਹੋਰ ਇਲਾਕਿਆਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਸ਼ਹੀਦ ਕਰਕੇ ਲਾਸ਼ਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਣਮਰਸ਼ਾਤੀਆਂ ਦੱਸ ਕੇ ਸਾੜ ਦੇਵੇ ਜਾਂ ਸੈਕੜੇ ਸਿਆਸੀ ਕੈਦੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਜਸੇਦਾਰ ਹਵਾਰੇ ਦੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਲਗਾਤਾਰ ਨਜ਼ਰਬੰਦ ਰੱਖੇ ਜਾਂ ਦਰਿਆਵਾਂ ਦੇ ਪਾਣੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਖੋਹ ਕੇ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਨੂੰ ਬੰਜਰ ਬਣਾ ਦੇਵੇ ਇਹ ਸਭ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਅੰਦਰ ਘਟ ਗਿਣਤੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਦੋ ਨੰਬਰ ਦੇ ਹਿੰਦੂ ਬਣਾ ਕੇ ਜਾਇਜ਼ੀ ਹੋ ਜਾਵੇਗਾ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਕਾਨਫਰੰਸ ਕਮੰਤਰੀ ਜਾਗਰਤਾ ਲਈ ਅਤਿ ਜ਼ਰੂਰੀ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਲਈ ਸਰਵਤ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਸਾਜੇ ਨਵਾਜੇ ਸੀਰੀ ਕਾਲਤਾ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜਸੇਦਾਰ ਪਾ ਜਗਤਾਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਹਵਾਰਾ ਦੀ ਪਰ ਦਾ ਪਰਪੂਰ ਅਸ਼ੀਰਵਾਦ ਅਤੇ ਸ਼ੁਭ ਅਸ਼ਾਵਾਂ ਪੇਸ਼ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਗੁੱਡ ਆਫਟਰਨੂਨ ਏਵਰੀਬਾਡੀ ਅਮ ਮਾਈ ਨੇਮ ਇਜ਼ ਫਿਲ ਬੈਨਨ ਐਂਡ ਆਈ ਯੂਜ਼ ਟੂ ਬੀ ਅਮ ਅ ਮੈਂਬਰ ਆਫ ਦ ਯੂਰੋਪੀਅਨ ਪਾਰਲੀਮੈਂਟ ਅੰਟਿਲ 2014 ਐਂਡ ਐਟ ਥੈਟ ਟਾਈਮ ਆਈ ਵਾਸ ਦ ਲਿਬਰਲ ਗਰੁੱਪ ਸਪੋਕਸ ਪਰਸਨ ਔਨ ਸਾਊਥ ਏਸ਼ੀਆ ਅਮ ਨਾਉ ਸਾਊਥ ਏਸ਼ੀਆ ਇਨਕਲੂਡਿਡ ਅਮ ਏਵਰੀਥਿੰਗ ਬਟ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਇਫ ਯੂ ਲਾਈਕ ਇਟ ਵਾਸ ਵੀ ਹੈਡ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ Uh, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Maldives, uh, but India had its own delegation, so um, uh, it was limited what I could uh, do on the Sikh front, but I did quite a, quite a bit. Um, firstly, I'm going to speak a little bit about human rights. Now, uh, I'm a member of Liberal International's Human Rights Committee, and uh, in that uh, respect, I've twice spoken at the United Nations. Um, I'm given a brief what to speak on. One of them was calling for the release of Anwar Ibrahim in Malaysia when he was leader of the opposition. If you remember, he was imprisoned. He's now free. Um, and the other one was actually on domestic violence in Russia. But um, when I was in the European Parliament, my focus was largely on Kashmir, uh, to a lesser extent on the Sikhs, and also uh, quite a lot on Bangladesh. Uh, but the whole uh, whole region kept me busy because we also had the aftermath of the civil war in Sri Lanka um and and uh, my my main issues in uh Kashmir were the uh, disappearances um the, the perpetual in out of imprisonment uh, of Yasin Malik and uh, also the use of uh, by India of the death penalty and in in one or two ex uh, 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 um, situations without giving access to the, the families. So a lot of these issues were directly just human rights issues. Uh, and with the Sikhs, um, I very much took up the case of Balwant Singh, who was uh, uh, threatened with a death penalty. We're not suggesting the, that he was not uh, in any way a criminal, but uh, the death penalty is something we absolutely abhor and oppose. and uh, so i i addressed a sikh rally in plas luxembourg in in belgium and also marched at the head of a column of sikhs in wolverhampton calling for the indian government to drop its threat of the uh, the death penalty against balwant singh now uh, when it comes to um uh, democracy and self determination um i've my own view is that uh, the right of voting the right to organize the right to uh take take democratic control is as much a human right as these other human rights uh, and in that respect uh, i've managed to get that uh, ele- elevated uh, for liberal international which is the global group of liberal parties um to one of its key um one of it, one of its key aims um with uh, with the, with the situation um of self determination for the sikhs my view is very very clear it uh, as long as they they're clearly a uh, a recognizable group of, of occupying a a recognizable area of land uh so the 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 test would be whether democratically there would be a a majority uh for self determination and uh, as long as there is then i would absolutely back it now we've had to deal with this within the uh, liberals in europe because we had the situation in spain where we had the basque and the catalan nationalists inside the liberal group but also the the most outspoken unionist party in spain through dedanus also in the same group so we actually had to come up with some uh, clear 
uh, and, and rational uh, solutions as to in what circumstances we would back self-determination. And that's what I've just given you. As long as there is a majority for self-determination, we absolutely back it. Now, in the situation in Kashmir, many of you will know that I have been pushing for uh, a, new, uh, a new settlement, a new initiative uh, on Kashmir that rather stalled when I lost my seat in 2014, but I have actually kept it on the back burner and kept pushing it whenever, I had the, whenever, I had, whenever I've had the chance. And, and I think that is, again, this buffer state idea is, is really uh, something to, to work for. Now, again, with the Sikhs, I would push them, urge them to democratically try and get enough uh, support within uh, what you call Khalistan, the area of the Punjab that is in India, um, get enough support to actually run the local provinces and get and get and, and so that you're in charge. Um, you actually have to use all the democratic processes you can. And at the moment, with India having this Hindi, Hindu nationalist type of government. Um, there is every reason for you to be able to garner democratic support for uh, for more devolution, and more devolution can be a precursor to independence and uh, and creating another another buffer state. Finally, I'd just like to say something on this nuclear issue. Uh, I mean, we, we yes, we have a, it, it is a, a, a such a threat to world peace, not just peace in the Indian sub subcontinent. Um, uh, and, but I certainly wouldn't want to see uh, military intervention uh, by outside forces going in there. That's probably going to make things worse. Um, but we have, to w we have to work diplomatically uh, and try and take the steam out of it. Now, the Indian election coming up has not helped things because it means that the um, Modi's group have, ha have been sort of beating the drum more, more than is healthy. Uh, but possibly after the election might be a better time to start uh, looking to defuse the situation. I, I have to say that Imran Khan so far has uh, exceeded my expectations in his handling of the crisis, but um, you know, he, he's, he's been a little bit un, um, unreliable in his, his sort of emotional responses in the past, and we don't know how long his, his sort of stable um, control at the moment has, has is going to last. But he's done pretty well so far. So let's hope that after the Indian election we can get the two together within, within the scope of the United Nations that we should be putting forward uh, our help as much as we can. And, you, and the EU can put forward its help as well. Remember that the European Union actually has an ethical foreign policy. I don't know if you remember Robin Cook's ideas of an ethical foreign policy for Britain, but the EU has this ethical foreign policy, it uses human rights and democracy, um, it uses its own power, its own trade, its own access to markets, its GSP plus general system of preferences to actually push forward on human rights and democracy. So let's, ever, let's get all of those forces together and see if we can get a peaceful resolution to this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Um, some uh, some good good original thinking, some good analysis there. Not everybody's going to agree with everybody else, so we're open to thinking and analysis and ideas. So I'm grateful for you for, for taking the time out and joining us today. Um, I, I do hope that uh, this is something that you could take back to your to your party leadership. It's an issue that, that absolutely needs to be addressed. Yes, uh, I, I'm actually on, uh, uh, I'm Vice Chair of our International Relations Committee, so I get a direct access to Joe Swinson, who's currently sure. Foreign, uh, foreign Affairs spokesperson. Yeah. Uh, I can get hold of her any time I want and, and put these ideas forward. Thank you. No Thank problem. you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, we've got a, quite a lot of other speakers to come on, um, but I am going to put, um, if I may, I may uh, get Anthea to speak next, because I think Anthea is one of those who needs to move to other commitments. So, um, Anthea McIntyre is an MEP of the Conservative Party and is standing again for the for election at the European Parliament forthcoming elections. Um, I believe Anthea has had a, an interest in South Asia, um, so I'm hoping that you know, she'll come with, with her ideas and hopefully, as with Phil, a commitment 
to take this up at the Conservative Party higher level. That's fine. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and honour to be with you today. And I want to thank you, Randit, for organising this conference. It is a hugely important topic. And we've heard some really quite inspiring words from speakers earlier. I'm particularly pleased, I think he's had to go, that um, Dr. Chimel was yeah. here. I very much enjoyed hearing him. And another quick call out, I have to say, I'm delighted to see Jaspreet Singh sitting there, who was um, in the chair of the Students' Union of BCU mm -hmm. and helped with organising a conference that I ran in Birmingham. So it's, it's, it's great to see quite a number of friends in the audience today. And I'm also joined by a colleague, Ahmed Ijaz, who is on our list of candidates for the European elections, which are coming up rather more quickly than I would have liked. <laughs> but um, I don't particularly think I need to talk about European elections, but I do need to talk about what we're doing in the EU as members of the European Parliament. I think I want to start um, just from the uh, to recognise the the seriousness of the situation in South Asia. Um, as all has already been said, we have three nuclear powers, and we have a rising of tension um, and potential conflict between Pakistan and India, which should be worrying everyone. So, I think that. Here in this country, it is very important that we raise awareness, just as you are doing, for the needs of the Sikh nation. And I fully support self-determination for all peoples. It's up to those nations to decide for themselves what they want to do. Um, and as we saw in the case of Scotland, if, if we can give Scotland a vote on their self-determination, then why can't we give it to the Sikhs and the people of Kashmir and all peoples that want to have a say in their own futures? So I will continue to do that. And let me also say here in this country, I started an organisation in the West Midlands called West Midlands Together. And I did this with representatives from the Labour Party and from the Liberal Democrats. Again, all party. And we're working to show that hate crime has no place, particularly within our politics. We have to remember that politics can be dangerous. You only have to look at the tragedy of Joe Cox. So it is important that all politicians say hate crime is completely abhorrent to us and we will all stand for peace and a peaceful solution. So I promise you I will continue to do this in the European Parliament and in my capacity as your member of the European Parliament representing the West Midlands. I will continue to stand up for the people of Kashmir and happy to do whatever I can for the Sikhs both within my party and hopefully for a, a little while longer in the European Parliament. And all I would say at the end to, to say all of these things come from our hearts. And one of my favourite quotations is actually from Gandhi who says, be the change you want to see in the world. And that's what we can all do as politicians or individuals. Be the change. Stand for peace. And that's what I want to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you um, to Anthea, who I think was very, very refreshing in the sense that we have a commitment to take up these issues She's endorsed everything that we've asked her to endorse. And she's committed to take it up with her party, both at European level and generally. So I'm really grateful for, for what you've said. Appreciate that. Um, before I turn to Professor Scholl, um, who is a long-standing expert on South Asia, uh, very widely respected um, 
campaigner and analyst, and I might add, supporter of the, the Sikh. And, you know, as a Kashmiri, sitting next to the Sikhs, shoulder to shoulder, facing the same issues, not just of our self-determination struggles in Punjab and Kashmir, respectively, but also facing this threat of annihilation, frankly, because of the warmongering of uh, Indian Prime Minister Modi and his party. So we'll, we'll, we'll hear from you shortly, uh, Professor Shaw. But before then, I'd like to call um, Gurpreet Singh of Saving Punjab. Um, so Gurpreet Singh, I don't know. Gurpreet Singh is going to address the issue from a Sikh perspective um, and maybe I think he's a youngster who's got some technology so uh, maybe he'll impress us with some slides, we'll see. Uh, Gurpreet Singh, please. My name is Gurpreet Singh, um, I work a part of an organisation called Saving Punjab that is currently working within Punjab and working on many issues that are going on within Punjab. So our organization is looking at statistical figures within Punjab to see what is going on with the minorities within Punjab. Today I'm going to be talking about a few issues. I'm going to talk about uh, the British rule. I'm going to be talking about the independence within India. And I'm going to be speaking about current Punjab specifically talking about five issues within Punjab. So my talk will consist of 10 minutes. I'm going to be covering a lot of issues. Um, within these issues, the, the actual subject is quite broad, but I am going to kind of go over them very briefly. So the first of my issues uh, is going to be speaking about uh, the Sikh Empire, going on to the British rule, and then independence, the post-independence and current Punjab. The main place affected, as Dr. Chima mentioned before, was Punjab. Many of the people died were cross, crossing that border from West Punjab to current Punjab. Most of the conflicted area was of that Punjab, but the huge part of this was Punjab was divided down the middle. So those people that lived within Punjab were lost from their families from each side. And you can see across Punjab there was a lot of conflict across the areas of Punjab. Now further, after the independence, Punjab was then further divided. So the original Punjab was then further divided after 1947 and then after 1971 again Punjab was divided. Right, so after the independence, Punjab was divided, again in many issues, and then the, the Sikhs that stayed within India, again had to face many issues. So Punjab, the whole of India was reconstructed on bilingual basis, and Punjab was given the, the, the state where Punjabi is spoken. Now, the Sikhs started to protest because Punjabi, the main language of Punjab, was taken away from them. And over 40,000, I think the figure is a lot higher, but around 40,000 people caught in arrest. Many died fighting for the rights of their language. Now, coming to today's event, we're talking about war, we're talking about peace, how we want peace amongst these two nations that are going up against each other. Statistically speaking, India and Pakistan have been at war every 20 or so years. So you can see 1947, 1965, 1971, 1999. The correlation shows that a war is amongst us within the next few years. That's statistics speaking. And Pulmama was the prime example of India and Pakistan going ahead at each other. Now that is just the wars. How many conflicts, how many standoffs has India and Pakistan had amongst each other? <laughs> standoffs. Many. And those people living within Kashmir 
on living within Punjab are always on edge thinking, okay, when's war going to break out? When do we have to think about our livelihood? When do we have to move? When can we keep our family safe? And that anxiety hangs over Punjabis today and Kashmiris. So what do we want? In terms of saving Punjab, we're going to talk about current issues in Punjab today. But Punjabis do not want war. I don't think Kashmiris want either. But Punjab is expendable for India. India does not care for Punjab and we will prove that to you statistically today. Punjab is deliberately being targeted across many issues within India. And eventually, if Punjab was to go to war, it would be a great loss. Also for Kashmiris. Okay, so the five issues of current issues I'm going to talk to you today are, st are a statistical analysis of what is going on currently in Punjab. So the first issue I'm going to talk about is drugs. So before I start, I want to speak about Punjab today. The current Punjab covers about 1.5% of the geographical area of India. This 1.5 geographical area, we're going to speak about how this contributes to so many issues within Punjab. And why is Punjab important to the Sikhs? Punjab is where 75% of the world's Sikh population live. So if Punjab is affected, the whole Sikh nation is affected. Okay, so the following image is a document from the CIA reports and it talks about international drug trafficking amongst the world and the area to highlight is the golden crescent which is directly above the india pakistan and afghanistan region and you can see within this region punjab plays a pivotal role within the golden crescent as drugs are traffic trafficked from afghanistan to pa pakistan and then they enter india via the punjab corridor Punjab is the corridor for drugs entering India. And you can see specifically Amritsar because it's a border region is one of the places where drugs enter India and then are distributed to the rest of India. Now what effects are, are this what effects is this ha ha having amongst the Punjabis? Statistics show from the Guru Nanak University report that 73% of the rural youth are addicted to some kind of drug. Punjab's youth currently are facing many, many problems in terms of drugs. And that is specifically, specifically because of that drug corridor. And India's lack of intervention to stop that from happening. So the statistics show that from 2000 and 2015, you can see how the transformation from where largely opium drugs were used and now 90% of the addicts are using heroin. So how the drugs are intensifying. And this last slide on drugs, I want you to pay particular attention to, which shows that from 2011 to 2014, 50% of all drug seized throughout the whole of India were from Punjab. This 1.5 geographical area, this small percentage is where 50% of the drugs are being seized. If that is an area concern for India, what is? Moving on to the second topic, which is water. Water was mentioned a few times today, but specifically speaking about what Nasser is saying, Nasser is saying, that Punjab, Rajasthan should be very worried about the water. The water table is dropping. Now, why is it dropping? There's many reasons. It can link to agriculture, it can link to diverted water, which is causing the ground level of water to decrease. So, the water of Punjab is actually unsafe as it is. Statistics show that Punjab's water is high on uranium, which is causing other effects. And also, the water of Punjab is being overpumped from ground levels. The reason of overpumping is because of agriculture uses, but also because 
the water is being diverted to other states. Now, you can see the graph directly to the top left. It <coughs> says that the Punjab's water has decreased massively from the 1980s to 2000. And Punjab, you can clearly see, is 172% when it comes to the state that consumes more than it can recharge. Simply because Punjab contributes to <coughs> India's agriculture. And in terms of irrigation, Punjab is the highest amongst all India states. So if anyone needs water, it's Punjab. But again, we know Punjab's water is being diverted through this Satluj and Yamuna Canal. So we need water, but it's been taken away so that other states can use the water. Now Punjab contributes to 50% of the agriculture that goes in terms of grain, the wheat and paddy to the center. And that's just from this 1.5 geographical area. Now, the highest rate of farmer suicide from 2015 in terms of a percentage increase is of the Punjabi people. This 1.5 geographical area is where most of these farmers are committing suicide. Now speaking about pesticides, right. In 2018, the Punjab government banned over 20 pesticides that the World Health Organization had banned many years ago. They're deemed hazardous and still Punjab's government is using them pesticides that have a direct link to cancer, have a direct link to infertility, impotency and many, many other health problems. Which goes on to the, the topic of cancer. <coughs> this picture image you see here is from the MBC News. And the NBC News saying is, Punjab is the capital cancer of India. Per population, there are more people suffering from, from cancer in Punjab than anywhere else. And if that isn't a shock to the Indians, that a 1.5 geographical area is contributing to the high percentage of cancer within India, and there is no specialist cancer hospital within Punjab. Some of you might have heard of the cancer train where a, cancer tr a train goes from uh, Punjab to Rajasthan so people could be cured for cancer outside of the state. Whereas there's such a high population of cancer within India or within Punjab and people are going elsewhere to be treated. And this has a direct link to the pesticides being used from studies, especially in the Malwa area. So just, just a point to think on that, Punjab the Sikhs had Punjab, the Sikhs ruled, the Sikhs fought back for, for, for Punjab, they fought for the independence against the British, they were divided into two, then again divided again, and then now the 75% population of Sikhs within Punjab are suffering again from these issues. And then last of my topics of issues to speak to, I mean I'm, I'm speaking very briefly upon these topics. These topics are quite complex um, in terms of the depth of them and understanding the overall problem. I'm basically touching upon these problems because I don't have the time here to speak in depth on them. But these problems are a lot more complex than we can see. Fertility amongst India. Now, the fertility amongst Kashmir and Punjab is a lot lower than any other states. And the reason for this is, uh, one of the reasons is that 200,000 uh, deaths that were because of the, the genocide over the last 35 years within Punjab and that is causing a lot of pro, post uh, dramatic stress and you, could, you can see clearly that Punjab has a low fertility rate if you look at the statistics of Punjab's fertility rate it's, it's absolutely low now comparing the statistics of fertility to language was one of the uh, correlations that were seen amongst the studies and this is the overall fertility rate within India and you can see the area where there's a high fertility rate is in red and the low fertility rate is in blue now the fertility rate has a direct link to drug addictions uh, which is causing a lot of the Punjabis to have uh, infertility 
but directly linking the fertility rates to language, you can see the correlation of where Hindi is spoken, the fertility is high, and those states that don't speak Hindi, the fertility rate is low. Now, this is not my assessment, this is just something I came upon, but I'd like you to think upon yourself what the correlation might be between the language and fertility rates. So, just to conclude, I've kind of briefly spoke upon many points um, within India and Punjab. Punjab is already drowning at the hands of the Indian government. Nuclear exchange will be detrimental for Punjab and Punjabis. Punjab falls in a place where it is very, very dangerous. You know, Bill Clinton says it's the most dangerous place in the world, the Indian-Pakistan border. But especially because of China, having nuclear powers, Pakistan having nuclear powers, and India having nuclear powers. Punjab would suffer, also Kashmir would, at the hands of nuclear war. Why would you call Khalsa? Why would you keep it there? Thank you to all the speakers that have been on so far. The problem is when you do these speeches and, and discussions, most of it's been said before. So if I was only going to say one thing, I would say that Dr. Chi, Chima is not mad as he suggested, but a visionary because he's talking about something which should have been introduced many years before and hopefully it will in the future. But very briefly then, um, I just wrote some notes down about everyone of course says they believe in peace. You know, there's not too many people publicly say we want war. Except Modi. Except Modi. <laughs> but merely saying so doesn't make it, doesn't make it happen. You know, it's platitudes. It's what we, we desire. But obviously we, what, we live for other things. Self-determination obviously has been mentioned. We could spend hours discussing why do we need self-determination, why do people feel they're different from another people, a culture's been different in the history, but we haven't got time for that. But it's clear uh, in Nation Without State's belief that if you want peace, or one form of peace, one of the conditions to making it happen is in fact recognition and application of the principle of self-determination. In other words, where people choose how and by whom they should be governed. It's a failure of governments and international agencies to resolve issues of national identity and sovereignty that ensures global peace remains a pipe dream. It is not a coincidence that some of the longest running conflicts in the modern world are cessationist. Struggles, Kashmiris, Tibetans, Kurds, Tamils, it goes on and the Sikhs would probably put themselves in that struggle. Maybe it's peaceful at, at this moment in time. Some are violent, some are peaceful, but all have the capacity to escalate to violence and, and various repression. Few wars now occur between borders. Few involve invasions or bombardments across frontiers. Perhaps the last example was the Allied invasion of um, Iraq. You might include, say, the Turkish invasion of northern Syria. But that was ostensibly via rebel proxies. Very few countries now say, we're going to invade our neighbours. They use proxies, they use groups with inside countries. Most warlike situations are actually due to internal division. Some of it political, such as Libya, where, where there's various sides want to take power. But most of it is self-determination. Peoples who've been struggling for centuries uh, for their, their land, Kashmiris, uh, um, Khalistan, and many and hill tribes in India, and there's probably about a hundred or so going on now around the world, but you don't hear about it, because the world elites don't want you to hear about it, because they'd rather keep the status quo. So, I think political differences probably can never be resolved, but struggles for self-determination can be, if the world's international agencies, if the world states accepted that it is a matter of national justice. And that if you don't solve those problems, these wars will go on forever. Sikhs, until Sikhs disappear as a people, that struggle will continue. Until Kashmiris disappear as a people, that conflict will continue forever. Uh, so if you really genuinely want peace, or if the states want peace, they need to look, reach out for, uh, to look for self-determination, some deals with the people. Now, in theory, what we would like, in principle, is a UN-supervised referendum throughout the whole world, where it's necessary, where people ask for it. There should be that. 
Will we get it? Well, I think it was been mentioned by uh, that Phil before that India will block that because they fear that what the result would be not what they would like. And we've had a referendum in Britain recently and look at the problems that that's caused with division with people not accepting that result. So India wouldn't want to be in position of allowing it, losing it, and then say, oh, well, no, we didn't really want that. So it is very difficult. Um, and maybe, of course, countries, which is another story, like to change the demographics. And we know that that's a problem around the world where they think, OK, if we ever had a referendum, we'd lose it. But let's bring in our own people. Han Chinese into Zhang. Han Chinese into Tibet. Uh, Hindus into uh, uh, Kashmir, etc., etc. But that's, that's another story. Even if there was no nuclear bombs used, uh, you know, a conventional war is still pretty bad, isn't it? And it's not something that we would likely just write off. And of course, in 1971, which is probably the, the largest invasion or the most recent one, there was no nuclear bombs in India or Pakistan, as far as we know. So we don't know, there's no precedence of would it not escalate. And of course, if India attacked in the, in the Punjab, as I said, could they do it to bring uh, it as a bargaining chip with Pakistan to say, well, you leave Kashmir alone and we'll leave you alone and we'll retreat from Lahore or wherever they got as a bargaining tool. You can't rule that out. And of course, what would, could, could a, a Pakistani general, in, a, in an emotional response, fire off some missiles in order to, for their pride, as possible? Um, I don't, I must admit, I'm unaware of the chain of command uh, of the Pakistani mu nuclear capability. Um, you know, could it be used without the Prime Minister's uh, acceptance? Would it need his precondition? I don't actually know that, maybe somebody does. But I have to say, I think, uh, I'm reasonably confident that Imran Khan wouldn't want to use a nuclear weapon because of his upbringing. I don't think he's totally involved in that emotional knee-jerk reaction. Uh, but again, we don't know, do we? Um, that's the optimist in me. But of course, all this is speculation. And the election of M Modi and more likely the re-election of Modi, the problem isn't actually Modi, in my opinion, it's the people behind him. The people who say, well, if you want to continue in power, you need to listen to us, you need to drive forward. Uh, but I don't think a nuclear uh, weapon will be used uh, other than by accident or by error or by emotion. I don't think it would be part of a strategy. It would be, but if, if India did want to invade Pakistan to teach them a lesson, to try and use it as a bargaining chip, that's when uh, the generals might want to use a nuclear weapon uh, against the forces in order to even things up. It would be a terrible, obviously, uh, uh, event, and the implications and the escalations, God only knows. Uh, but you could not rule it out. So the best way of stopping that in the short term is international intervention. I don't mean physical, but diplomatic intervention. Our voices are, are won't be listened to, although we try our best, and Ranjit always does. But generally we would need somebody of a higher diplomatic level in America or wherever to try and intervene and prevent and uh, uh, threaten, if you like, India, that we wouldn't accept that escalation. But in the long run, uh, you know, to... to stop this happening in the future we need the world needs to get to grips with what i call the need for a second decolonization you know unfinished business for when the empire european empires uh, uh, collapsed uh, and finished in a chaotic way as people have said but nevertheless uh, we didn't have a proper decolonization because the all the empires we the states or the provinces as they called it were all artificial they cut across borders, they cut across peoples. So clearly there needs to be another decolonisation. And until that happens, we're going to keep revis revisiting, and probably in this chamber over the next few years, talking about conflict which goes on time and time again. So Kashmir will never be solved. Khalistan and the Punjab will never be solved until there's a decolonisation, or at least, as Frangit says, the opportunity for peoples around the world to choose their futures. And I feel sad at the fact that the Kashmiris and the Sikhs are not allowed that opportunity. So the Indians got their independence. I'm happy to, for that to have happened. But they didn't then extend that courtesy to other peoples that they held. And you're not the only one. I know it's no real uh, comfort to say that, but there is about 100 different struggles going on around the world, in Africa and in Asia, and even the Catalans in, in Spain, who genuinely believe 
that the only way you can get genuine peace and, and justice is to have the right to self-determination, whether that's uh, assimilation, whether that's into, uh, um, uh, autonomy, or outright independence. And one day we need a visionary leaders like Dr. Chima actually running countries, then we may see change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Khalsa. Ji Ki Fateh, I will be very brief. Um, this conference is about peace, and nobody in the world can be against living a peaceful life. So the question is, what is the obstacle to coexistence and peaceful living? And the answer is simple, injustice. The denial of rights to ordinary people means that peace will never be possible without justice. So there are two sides of the same coin, and one cannot be realized without the other. But when we talk about justice, we are not simply talking about law. We are talking about social justice. We're talking about environmental justice and historical justice. And I'm pleased with the mission statement of the World Sikh Parliament, which reflects this expansive conception of justice and peace uh, when it talks about social, religious, political, linguistic, human, and environmental rights. Now, though we have international structures such as the UN, the rights of ordinary people across the planet are still being blatantly denied. And tragically today, the world is being carved up by powerful hegemonic states such as China, US, uh, the EU, Russia, and India. And these nuclear superpowers do not function to serve the interests of the ordinary, peaceful, uh, peace-loving people in the world, but the interests of 5% of the population of the world, which owns 95% of the wealth. 5% owns 95%. And today, when ordinary people and communities, Punjabis and Kashmiris and others uh, of the world demand basic needs, health, education, clean water, safety and the right to self-determination, they are labeled as terrorists and separatists just for demanding basic human rights. And it might be worth reminding ourselves that the majority of the countries of the world, including India and Pakistan, are less than 100 years old. The majority of the countries in the world are less than 100 years old. Uh, there is nothing natural about countries. It's the people that constitute nations. But today, people are denied their natural uh, indigenous rights to nationhood. So how can we achieve peace in the world? That's the key question. I'm going to just quote Martin Luther King. He said, peace cannot be kept by force. It cannot be achieved by, uh, without understanding. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. True peace is not merely the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. And in today's meeting, specifically focusing on Punjab and Kashmir, you know, we have been heard about John Speller and others and talk about the potentials for a nuclear catastrophe. But I would argue the fact that these two states are nuclear states actually makes uh, conventional warfare even more possible in Punjab because uh, both of them know that they will not drop bombs near their borders, nuclear bombs, but they will happily fight proxy wars as they have been doing since 47. Uh, so we demand uh, the rights of the planet, we demand rights of human beings. Um, uh, we need to think about uh, it, climate emergency because Punjab, the five rivers, uh, erosion of the rivers, er erosion of the coasts, and the rising of sea levels themselves will be reasons for conflict, uh, dramatic climate change. Across the world, from Trump in the US to Bolsonaro in Brazil, from Putin in Russia to Erdogan in Turkey, from Modi in India to Jinping in China, we are seeing the emergence of a politics of authoritarianism and fascism, where minorities and progressive people are being threatened. But tragically, trade seeks to always take precedence over human rights. So to conclude, I would say just four things. I would say we need to work for peace and we need to work for love and we need to join together. We say no to hatred. We say no to the destruction of the planet and we say no to super states. We say yes to self-determination, yes to Halemiraj, where people can live a peaceful coexistence. Let us create Begumpara, where social divisions are eradicated and fear and sorrow is banished. And let us establish Nanak Raj, the true fortress built on the strongest foundations of universal human rights and dignity. Thank you very much. Why good ji ka khalsa? Why good ji ki fateh? Why good ji ka khalsa? Why good ji ki fateh? Jaroo ji, I'm going to take a little time.
ਪਹਿਲਾ ਗੱਲ ਮਾਰਨ ਦਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਸ਼ੁਕਰੀਆ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਸਾਰੇ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਬੈਠੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਵਿਚਾਰਨ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਨੌਜਵਾਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਇਹ ਇੱਕ ਹਿਸਾਬ ਦਾ ਨੌਲੇਜ ਹੱਬ ਬਣ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਕਿ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਦੇਖਣ ਲੱਪ ਦਿਸਣ ਲੱਪਣ ਦਾ ਕਿ ਹਾਂ ਵੀ ਇਤਿਹਾਸ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਆ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਸੀ ਤਾਂ ਫਿਊਚਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੀ ਕੀ ਹੋ ਸਕਦਾ ਤਾਂ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਆ ਜੀ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਸ਼ੁਕਰ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਦਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਭ ਤੋਂ ਪਹਿਲੀ ਗੱਲ ਅੱਜ ਮੈਂ ਇਹ ਕਹਿਣਾ ਚਾਹੂੰਗਾ ਕਿ ਜ਼ੁਲਮ ਜਦੋਂ ਦਾ ਮਹਾਰਾਜ ਨੇ ਸਿੱਖ ਪੰਥ ਚਲਾਇਆ ਆ ਉਸ ਟਾਈਮ ਤੇ ਤਾਂ ਅੱਜ ਟਾਈਮ ਤੇ ਕੋਈ ਡਿਫਰੈਂਸ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈਗਾ ਕੋਈ ਡਿਫਰੈਂਸ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈਗਾ ਜਦੋਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਗੁਰਬਾਣੀ ਪੜ੍ਹਦੇ ਆ ਗੁਰਬਾਣੀ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜੁੜਦੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਮਹਾਰਾਜ ਹਮੇਸ਼ਾ ਆਈ ਹਦਾਇਤ ਦਿੰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਹਮੇਸ਼ਾ ਜ਼ੁਲਮ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਟਾਕਰਾ ਕਰਦਾ ਆ ਤੇ ਇੱਕ ਬੜੀ ਵਧੀਆ ਕਹਾਵਤ ਆ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਜੰਮਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਨਿਤ ਮਹਿਮਾ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਵੀ ਪੰਜਾਬ 'ਚ ਜੰਮਦੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਕੁਛ ਨਾ ਕੁਛ ਤਾਂ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੀ ਆ ਪਰ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਅੱਜ ਕੱਲ ਮੰਦੀ ਸ਼ਬਦਾਵਲੀ ਮੋਦੀ ਵਰਗੇ ਬੰਦਿਆਂ ਨੇ ਵਰਤੀ ਆ ਹਮੇਸ਼ਾ ਹਕੂਮਤ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੰਕਾਰੀ ਹਕੂਮਤ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਕਰਦੀ ਇਦਾਂ ਆ ਪਮਾ ਅੱਜ ਕੱਲ ਦਾ ਰਾਜ ਲਾ ਲਓ ਜਾਂ ਪਹਿਲਾ ਰਾਜ ਲਾ ਲਓ ਜਦੋਂ ਬੰਦੇ ਦਾ ਹੰਕਾਰ ਸੈਟ 'ਚ ਟੜ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਉਹ ਸਮਝਦਾ ਮੈਂ ਕੁਝ ਵੀ ਕਰ ਸਕਦਾ ਆ ਪਰ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਨੌਜਵਾਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਹੰਕਾਰੀ ਹਕੂਮਤਾਂ ਪਮਾ ਉਹ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਦੀ ਹਕੂਮਤ ਹੋਵੇ ਪਮਾ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਹਕੂਮਤ ਹੋਵੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਉਹ ਮੈਂਟੈਲਿਟੀ ਸਮਝਦੀ ਸਮਝਣ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਆ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਹਥਿਆਰ ਹਕੂਮਤਾਂ ਨੇ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਵੀ ਵਰਤੇ ਉਹ ਅੱਜ ਵੀ ਵਰਤਣ ਰਹੀਆਂ ਆ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਕਹ ਲੋ ਕਿਸੇ ਨੂੰ ਚੱਕ ਲੈਣਾ ਘਰੋਂ ਲਾਪਤਾ ਕਰ ਦੇਣਾ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਵੀ ਸਰਕਾਰਾਂ ਕਰਦੇ ਰਹੀਆਂ ਅੱਜ ਦੀਆਂ ਵੀ ਕਰਦੀਆਂ ਆ ਤੇ ਚੰਗਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਬਦਨਾਮ ਕਰਨਾ ਬਰਤਾਨਵੀ ਸਰਕਾਰ ਨੇ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਮਹਾਰਾਣੀ ਜਿੰਦ ਕੌਰ ਨੂੰ ਬਦਨਾਮ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੀ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਰਾਜ ਦੇ ਟਾਈਮ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਿਰਾਂ ਦੇ ਮੁੱਲ ਪਾਉਣੇ ਮੁਗਲ ਰਾਜ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਪਏ ਅੱਜ ਵੀ ਪੈ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਦੀ ਸਰਕਾਰ ਪਾ ਰਹੀ ਆ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਸਮਝੀਏ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਕਿਹੜੇ ਕਿਹੜੇ ਟੂਲ ਬਣਾਉਂਦੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਕਿਤੇ ਕਦੋਂ ਕਦੋਂ ਵਰਤਦੇ ਆ ਇਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਜ਼ਰੂਰਤ ਆ ਤੇ ਇੱਕ ਵਾਰੀ ਬੜੀ ਇੰਟਰਸਟਿੰਗ ਗੱਲ ਦੋ ਦਿਨ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਕਿਸੇ ਨਾਲ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦਾ ਪਿਆ ਸੀਗਾ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਸਮੇਂ ਬਾਰੇ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਨ ਡਏ ਸੀਗੇ ਤੇ ਸ਼ੁਕਰ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਦਾ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਗੁਰਸੇਖ ਹਨਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਅਕਾਲ ਅਕਾਲ ਚ ਬਲੀਵ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਮਸਕੀਨ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਤੁੱਕ ਯਾਦ ਆਈ ਮਸਕੀਨ ਜੀ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਅਤੀਤ ਇਤੀਤ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੋਇਆ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਜੋ ਕੁਝ ਹੋਇਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਸੋਚ ਕੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਕਹ ਲੋ ਪਛਤਾਵਾ ਕਰਦੇ ਰਹਿੰਦੇ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਫਿਊਚਰ ਬਾਰੇ ਸੋਚ ਕੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਚਿੰਤਤ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਰਹਿੰਦੇ ਆ ਪਰ ਸ਼ੁਕਰ ਕਰਦਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦਾ ਮਾਰਨ ਨੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਪ੍ਰੈਜ਼ੈਂਟ ਆ ਆਪਾਂ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੀ ਕਰੀਏ ਮਾਰੇ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਕਿ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਸ਼ੇਖ ਫਰੀਦ ਜੀ ਵੀ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਆਜ ਮਲਾਮਾ ਸ਼ੇਖ ਫਰੀਦ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਮਾਫ ਕਰੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਅੱਗੇ ਗੁਰਬਾਣੀ ਦੀ ਤੁਕ ਭੁੱਲ ਗਈ ਕਿ ਅੱਜ ਹੀ ਆ ਸਾਰਾ ਕੁਝ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰਹਿ ਕੇ ਚੈਲੰਜ ਕਰੀਏ ਤੇ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਗੁਰਸਿੱਖ ਨੈਰੇਟਿਵ ਆ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਉਹ ਬਾਹਰ ਦੀਆਂ ਸੰਸਥਾਵਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਸਿਰਫ ਬੋਲਣ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਆ ਮਹਾਰਾਜ ਨੇ ਕਦੀ ਕਦੀ ਮੈਂ ਆਪਣਾ ਵੀ ਸਮਝਦਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਕਿ ਮੇਰੇ ਵਰਗੇ ਨੂੰ ਅਕਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈਗੀ ਮੈਂ ਆਪਣੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਨੂੰ ਸਮਝ ਨਹੀਂ ਸਕਦਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਦੋਂ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਬੋਲਦੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਮਹਾਰਾਜ ਦੀ ਗੁਰਬਾਣੀ 'ਚ ਇੰਨਾ ਸਾਰਾ ਕੁਝ ਆ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਹੋਰਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਕਹ ਲੋ ਖੜੇ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਤੇ ਆਹੀ ਅਖੀਰ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਬਸ ਆਹੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਹਿਣਾ ਚਾਹੂੰਗਾ ਕਿ ਜੋ ਮੈਂ ਦੇਖਿਆ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀ ਭਾਈਆਂ ਦਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹ
ਜਿਸ ਮੌਕੇ ਸ਼੍ਰੋਮਣੀ ਅਕਾਲੀ ਦਲ ਦੇ ਪ੍ਰਧਾਨ ਇਤਿਹਾਸਕ ਬੁਜਦਲੀ ਵਿਖਾ ਕੇ ਪਿਛਲੇ ਦਰਵਾਜ਼ੇ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਹੀ ਰਵਾਨਾ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਸਨ ਸ਼ਾਇਦ ਉਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਬਣ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਤਾਂ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਬਟਵਾਰੇ ਤੋਂ ਇਲਾਵਾ ਤਿੰਨ ਵਾਰ ਹਿੰਦ ਪਾਕ ਜੰਗਾਂ ਦਾ ਸੰਤਾਪ ਹੰਡਾਉਣਾ ਪੈਂਦਾ ਹੰਡਾਉਣਾ ਪੈਂਦਾ ਅਤੇ ਨਾ ਹੀ ਅੱਜ ਪਰਮਾਣੂ ਸਰਬਨਾਚੀ ਦਾ ਖਤਰਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਅਫਸੋਸ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਸ਼੍ਰੋਮਣੀ ਅਕਾਲੀ ਦਲ ਦੀ ਲੀਡਰ ਲੀਡਰਾਂ ਨੇ ਬਾਰ-ਬਾਰ ਇਤਿਹਾਸਕ ਮੌਕਿਆਂ ਤੇ ਪਿਛਲੇ ਦਰਵਾਜ਼ਿਆਂ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਭੱਜਣ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕੀਤੀ ਚਾਹੇ ਉਹ ਚੰਡੀਗੜ੍ਹ ਲਈ ਮਰਨ ਵਰਤ ਰੱਖ ਕੇ ਜਾਂ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਲਈ ਅਕਾਲ ਤਖਤ ਤੋਂ ਧਰਮਯੁੱਧ ਮੋਰਚਾ ਆਰੰਭ ਕਰਕੇ ਸਿਰਫ ਟਕਸਾਲੀ ਜਾਂ ਸਿੱਖ ਆਵਾਮ ਪੰਥ ਦੀ ਖਾਤਰ ਆਪਣੀ ਜਾਨ ਦੀ ਕੁਰਬਾਨੀ ਲੱਖਾਂ ਦੀ ਤਦਾਦ ਵਿੱਚ ਦਿੰਦੇ ਆਏ ਹਨ ਇਸ ਲਈ ਵਰਤਮਾਨ ਲੋਕ ਸਭਾ ਚੋਣਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਲ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਸਿੱਖ ਸਟੂਡੈਂਟ ਫੈਡਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਟਕਸਾਲੀ ਅਕਾਲੀ ਦਲ ਜਾਂ ਹੋਰ ਪੰਥਕ ਉਮੀਦਵਾਰਾਂ ਦੀ ਹੀ ਹਿਮਾਇਤ ਕਰ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਭਾਵੇਂ ਪੰਜਾਬੀਆਂ ਲਈ ਲੋਕ ਸਭਾ ਦੀਆਂ ਚੋਣਾਂ ਯੂਕੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਉਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਯੂਰਪੀਆਂ ਚੋਣਾਂ ਨਾਲੋਂ ਵੀ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਫਜ਼ੂਲ ਕਿਉਂ ਨਾ ਹਮੇਸ਼ਾ ਸਾਬਤ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਹੋਣ ਕਦੇ ਕਦੇ ਇਤਨਾ ਹੀ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਬਾਲਦੀਆਂ ਵਰਗੀਆਂ ਬਾਦਲਿਆਂ ਬਾਦਲ ਕੇ ਹਾਂ ਵਾਇਗਰ ਬਾਦਲ ਕੇ ਹਾਂ ਵਰਗੀਆਂ ਬੁਜਦਿਲਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਨਾ ਮੁੜ ਕੇ ਆਉਣ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਜਾਵੇ ਔਰ ਫਿਰ ਬੇਅੰਤੇ ਵਰਗੇ ਬੁੱਚੜਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਨਸਲ ਕੁਸ਼ੀ ਢਾਉਣ ਦਾ ਨਾ ਮੌਕਾ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਜਾਵੇ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਰਵਾਇਤੀ ਅਕਾਲੀਆਂ ਦਾ ਭਾਈਵਾਲ ਨਰਿੰਦਰ ਮੋਦੀ ਦੇ ਹੁਣ ਮੁੜ ਕੇ ਪ੍ਰਧਾਨ ਮੰਤਰੀ ਬਣਨ ਨਾਲ ਪੰਜਾਬੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਪੰਜਾਬੀਆਂ ਦਾ ਕਾਂਗਰਸੀ ਗਾਂਧੀ ਨਹਿਰੂ ਖਾਨਦਾਨ ਦੇ ਬਰਾਬਰ ਦਾ ਨੁਕਸਾਨ ਹੀ ਹੋਣ ਵਾਲਾ ਹੈ ਅਖੀਰਲਾ ਪੈਰਾ ਹੈ ਜੀ ਜੰਮੂ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰ ਅਤੇ ਬਾਕੀ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀ ਵਿਦਿਆਰਥੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਹਿੰਦੂ ਤਵੀ ਭੀੜਾਂ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਨਿਸ਼ਾਨਾ ਬਣਾਉਣ ਮੋਦੀ ਦੀ ਹੀ ਦੇਣ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਦਾ ਵਿਰੋਧ ਵੀ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਨੇ ਜ਼ਬਰਦਸਤ ਤਰੀਕੇ ਨਾਲ ਕੀਤਾ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਭੀੜ ਨੇ ਹੀ ਸਿੱਖ ਵਿਦਿਆਰਥੀਆਂ ਉੱਤੇ ਬਿਦਰ ਕਾਂਡ ਵਰਗੇ ਹਮਲੇ ਕਈ ਦਿਹਾਕੇ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਹੀ ਟਾਏ ਸੀ ਇਸ ਇਹ ਨਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਕਿ ਕੁਝ ਹੋਰ ਦਿਹਾਕਿਆਂ ਤੱਕ ਆਪਾਂ ਇਹ ਅਜਿਹੇ ਜ਼ੁਲਮਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਸਹਾਰ ਦੇ ਰਹੀਏ ਆਪਸੀ ਤਾਲਮੇਲ ਤੇ ਖੁਦ ਮੁਕਤਿਆਰੀ ਤੇ ਸੰਕਲਪ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਹੀ ਹਿੰਦੂ ਤਵੀ ਸਮਾਜ ਰਾਜ ਦਾ ਸਾਹਮਣਾ ਹੋ ਸਕਦਾ ਹੈ ਜਿਸ ਲਈ ਅੱਜ ਦੀ ਕਾਨਫਰੰਸ ਇਹ ਮਿਸਾਲ ਹੈ ਜਿਸ ਨੂੰ ਉਲੀਕਣ ਲਈ ਵਿਸ਼ਵ ਸਿੱਖ ਸੰਸਦ ਅਤੇ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਆਫ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਵਧਾਈ ਦੇ ਪਾਤਰ ਹਨ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਜਿੰਦਾਬਾਦ ਜਗਰੂਪ ਸਿੰਘ ਕਨਵੀਨਰ ਆਲ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਸਿੱਖ ਸਟੂਡੈਂਟ ਫੈਡਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਮੈਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਧੰਨਵਾਦੀਆਂ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਆਪਣਾ ਇਹ ਸੱਦਾ ਘੱਲਿਆ ਤੇ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਨੌਜਵਾਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਸਮਝਣ ਟਾਈਮ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਗੁਰੂ ਨਾਲ ਜੁੜੀਏ ਤੇ ਤਿਆਰ ਹੋਈਏ ਆਉਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਸਮੇਂ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਪੁਲਾ ਜੋ ਕਾਦੀ ਖੇਮਾ ਜੀ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਦਾ ਸਿਮਨਜੀਤ ਸਿੰਘ ਵੋਲੰਟੀਅਰ ਐਟ ਦੀ ਐਸਟਨ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਸੋਸਾਇਟੀ ਮੋਸਦੀ ਜਨਰਲ ਸੈਕਟਰੀ ਐਟ ਦੀ ਐਸਟਨ ਯੂਨੀ ਲੇਬਰ ਕਲੱਬ ਐਂਡ ਦਾ ਟ੍ਰੈਜਰ ਆਫ ਦੀ ਐਸਟਨ ਪਲਸਟਾਈਨ ਸੋਸਾਇਟੀ ਸੋ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਇਜ਼ ਕੁਆਇਟ ਫਾਰ ਫ੍ਰੋਮ ਵੇਅਰ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਸਿਟਿੰਗ ਰਾਈਟ ਨਾਓ but nevertheless if we look at the jewish community if we look at the polish community they are all very entied to their homeland to their respective homelands and they keep track on what is happening um back home if you look at alexander the great where he battled in punjab 2000 years ago as my colleague um by good breathing mentioned he mentioned the four battles in which um indo india and pakistan fought if we look at um 1971 the battle of lahore quite a famous battle was fought on the punjab frontier and um that same land where alexander
An independent Sikh state in Punjab acting as a buffer state is the only guarantee solution for peace in the subcontinent. The Sikh and Kashmiri self-determination struggles must be addressed as part of the conflict resolution so that we can truly bring peace to the subcontinent. The late Lieutenant General Jajit Singh Arora in December 1990 was quoted as saying, a fierce psychosis has gripped the state. Such a state like the present comes but rarely in human affairs. However, its force can blind all and everyone. Let us challenge the darkness and collectively we will establish light. Vaheguruji ka khalsa, Vaheguruji ki fateh. Vaheguruji ka khalsa, Vaheguruji ki fateh. Sab to pehla tha main tarwaad kar da, wal sikh paadi mein da jinnan ne aaj di ek anfras jodi rakhi aur jithe saade jo asi apni kaum di, jo asi apni azadi ni ladai jodi lad raha jithe saade aaj sikh pra, saade aaj kashmiri pra, saare hajar hoye ne biro mein ek aale kani chona saare hi bula raha ne. आप वो अपने विचार रखें जिधर आज ना साड़ा मेन जिधर साड़ा अजंडा जिधर हैगा आपने सेक्स कॉम दी अजादी रह जिधर साड़ा मसला जब मैं अपन देखते हैं जो आज हिंदुस्तान दे अंदर पात दे अंदर उस मोदी हकुमत बलों जो साड़े सेक्का दे होते हैं जहाँ कश्मीर दे बेच जो जबर जरूर जिधर टाया जा रहा जड़िया कोमा आपने अजादीदा शिंग आचे लड़ रही हैं आपने कोम दे ले उन्होंने ना मोटे ना मोटा लाके अकठे होके ऐसी आपने अजादी दी लड़ाई ऐसी आपने कोमी गाल जड़ी आज वर्ल्ड लेवल दे होते जड़ी पिचाईये ताज़ी जड़ा ऑन वाले समय रे अंदर ओसे हिंदुस्तान दी देश तो बादी जड़ी मोदी दी सरकार है और उसे ठाल पा सकते हैं और बड़े गोपत अजंडे ग्रुप यारे खालसा जी ऑन वाले समय रे अंदर मोदी सरकार बोलो जड़े अलीके गए किस तरह ऑन वाले समय रे अंदर अगर फर्द जड़ी सरकार होते मोदी दी बाढ़ � मैं सारे ही जड़े आज जितने सारे बीर पहुंचे ने उन्हें तरह आर कर दें सारे प्रबंध का ना तरह आर कर दें जिन्हें ने सालों टाइम देता सारे ऐसे कठे मठे हो के मोटे नल मोटा जोड़ के अपने काम दिए जादी रही खालस्तान दिए जादी ले जड़े ऐसे अपने बाद जड़ के अपने बाद जड़ी बलादे करिए खालस्तान जिंद और मैंने इतने समाज देने भी तो आधारन वाद वाहे गुरजी का खालसा वाहे गुरजी की फते जी मैं तकरीबन मैं ज़्यादा डिटेल तो वैसे नहीं जाना आप बस सारे याने इतने डिस्कशन की थी या सेल्फ डिटरमिनेशन जिधर मेन आज दा फोकल पॉइंट है या वो ये या के सेल्फ डिटरमिनेशन ये लिया वो साढे ले जरूरी वो सानू अजाज़त दिंदा या आपना ये राइट टू सेल्फ डिटरमिनेशन ये रहा या ये हाक एक्सरसाइज़ करना तकरीबन पंजाब या जिन्हें अभी प्रॉब्लम्स रहे वो ऐसी सारे अन्य डिस्कस की थी या सो जो उसे हो रहा है वो भी सानू पता या मैं जाना उधर वैसे नहीं जाना जो ना पर सानू देखा भी लोड है असली वो हासिल किधर करना? पॉइंट तो ये है, प्रॉब्लम साढे अधिया सानू पता है, साढे को तो नून की है, सानू ये भी पता। इंटरनेशनल लो सानू अजाज़त दंडा कि असी अपना राज पाग साड़ी कॉम के लिए इस दे काबल या और असी यूएन दिया जिन्हें भी तरह माया, उन्हें उते खड़े उत्तर दिया कि सानू अपना र पर देखने वाली और गाल ये है सेल्फ डिटरमिनेशन का जिधर राइट या वो एक्सरसाइज के दाग करना ऐसे जिधर आपने ब्रिटिश नमाइंदे भी आए सी सो असी तरह आता है ऐसे जिस सरकार दा भी जिधर ये सानू बारह तरीक नू पिछले साल दी और दस दी लंदन डेक्लारेशन जिधर ये रेफरेंडम 2020 दी होई या � अपनी फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच ला उन्हें ना नहीं देता है पर ऐसी अपना राज पाग अपना देश बढ़ावा के दाया गाले है कानून अंतर्राष्ट्रीय कानून आरी डी डे या पूरी सेल्फ डिटरमिनेशन दे जिले साढे हाकवेज कानून ने वो साढे ले किधर सा है यूँ साढे या पर ये डी डे किन्हा चर टेबल दे रहोगी किन्हा चर ऐसी सेल्फ 
ਪਰ ਹੁਣ ਨੂੰ ਇੰਪਲੀਮੈਂਟ ਕਿਦਾਂ ਕਰਨਾ ਗੱਲ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਿੰਨੇ ਵੀ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਦੇ ਮੁਲਕ ਨੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ رابطہ ਵੀ ਕੀਤਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਚਿੱਠੀ ਪੱਤਰ ਵੀ ਕੀਤਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਸੀਂ ਦੱਸਿਆ ਕਿ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਆਪਣਾ ਰਾਈਟ ਐਕਸਰਸਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਨ ਦਾ ਹੱਕ ਹੋਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਔਰ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਇਹ ਦਬਾਅ ਨਾ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਕਿ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਕਰਵਾਵੇ ਯੂਐਨ ਦੀ ਸੁਪਰਵਿਜ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਸ ਨੂੰ ਕਿ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਰੋਕ ਰਿਹਾ ਅਗਰ ਉਹ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰਵਾਉਂਦਾ ਤਾਂ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਦੇ ਕੋਲ ਹੱਕ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਆਪਣਾ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਕਰਵਾ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਕਤਲੋਨੀਆਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਹੋਇਆ ਕੁਰਦਿਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਹੋਇਆ ਔਰ ਇੱਕ ਗੱਲ ਹੋਰ ਮੈਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਸਪਸ਼ਟ ਕਰਨੀ ਚਾਹੁੰਦਾ ਹਾਂ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਪਾਜੀ ਕੋਈ ਸਰਵੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਇਹ ਕੋਈ ਪਬਲਿਕ ਓਪੀਨੀਅਨ ਨਹੀਂ ਇਹ ਪਬਲਿਕ ਓਪੀਨੀਅਨ ਤਾਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਲੋ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਨੂੰ ਰੈਕੋਗਨਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਦਾ ਸੋ ਜੇ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਨੀ ਆ ਕਿ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਸੈਲਫ ਡਿਟਰਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਹੱਕ ਨੇ ਇਹਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਹੈ ਉਹਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣਾ ਮੁਲਕ ਬਣਾਉਣਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਦੱਸੋ ਸਾਡੇ ਕੋਲ ਕਿਹੜੀ ਮੈਂਡੇਟ ਹੈ ਦੱਸੋ ਸਾਡੇ ਕੋਲ ਕਿਹੜਾ ਤਰੀਕਾ ਆ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਬਾਕੀ ਕੰਟਰੀਆਂ ਦੇ ਅੱਗੇ ਪ੍ਰੂਵ ਕਰ ਸਕੀਏ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖ ਆਪਣਾ ਰਾਜ ਭਾਗ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਜਾਂ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀ ਆਪਣਾ ਰਾਜ ਭਾਗ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਅੱਜ ਤਾਈ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਨੇ ਗੱਲ ਸਿਰਫ ਤੇ ਸਿਰਫ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਰਾਈਟ ਇਸ਼ੂਜ਼ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਕੀਤੀ ਆ ਮੇਰੇ ਵੀਰ ਬੈਠੇ ਨੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਆ ਕਦੀ ਵੀ ਇੰਡੀਪੈਂਡੈਂਸ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਗੱਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੋਈ ਹਮੇਸ਼ਾ ਹੀ ਗੱਲ ਵਾਇਓਲੇ ਵਾਇਓਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਆਫ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਰਾਈਟਸ ਤੇ ਹੋਈ ਆ ਕਦੀ ਵੀ ਇੰਡੀਪੈਂਡੈਂਟ ਸਟੇਟ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰ ਤੇ ਗੱਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੋਈ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਜੇ ਅੱਜ ਅਸੀਂ 1.5 ਮਿਲੀਅਨ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀ ਤੇ ਸਿੱਖ ਬ੍ਰਿਟਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰਹਿੰਦੇ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਵੋਟਾਂ ਪਾਉਂਦੇ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਥੋਂ ਦੀ ਸਰਕਾਰ ਇਲੈਕਟ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਪੂਰਾ ਹੱਕ ਹੈ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਪੀਲ ਵੀ ਕਰੀਏ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਰਜ ਕਰੀਏ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਤੇ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ਼ਰ ਬਿਲਡ ਕਰੀਏ ਕਿ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਜਨੀਵਾ ਕਨਵੈਨਸ਼ਨ ਸਾਈਨ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ਼ਰ ਪਾਓ ਕਿ ਉਹ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਕਰਵਾਉਣ ਦੇ ਜਾਂ ਤਾਂ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੀਆਂ ਧਰਾਵਾਂ ਥੱਲੇ ਔਰ ਉਸ ਦੀ ਸੁਪਰਵਿਜ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਥੱਲੇ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਕਰਵਾਏ ਜੇ ਉਹ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰਵਾਉਂਦਾ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਪੂਰਾ ਹੱਕ ਹੈ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਕਰਵਾਉਣ ਦਾ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਵੀ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਵਸਦਾ ਹੈ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਸ਼ਨਲੀ ਡਿਜੀਟਲਸ ਪੀਪਲ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆ ਇੰਡੀਜੀਨਸ ਪੀਪਲ ਵੋਟ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਸੋ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਤੇ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ਼ਰ ਪਾਉਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੱਲਾ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਰਾਈਟ ਇਸ਼ੂ ਨਹੀਂ ਇੰਡੀਪੈਂਡੈਂਟ ਸਟੇਟ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੋਣੀ ਚਾਹੀਦੀ ਹੈ ਔਰ ਉਹ ਤਾਂ ਹੋ ਸਕਦੀ ਹੈ ਜੇ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੁਆਰਾ ਰੈਕੋਗਨਾਈਜ਼ਡ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਹੈ ਉਹਦੇ ਦੁਆਰਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਮੈਂਡੇਟ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਜਾਈਏ ਜਾਂ ਜੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਹਥੈਸ਼ੀ ਨੇ ਬੇਸ਼ੱਕ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਹੋਵੇ ਬੇਸ਼ੱਕ ਉਹ ਕੈਨੇਡਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਬ੍ਰਿਟਨ ਹੋਵੇ ਬੇਸ਼ੱਕ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦਾ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਹੈ ਜੇ ਉਹ ਕਹਿੰਦਾ ਕਿ ਮੈਂ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਦਾ ਔਰ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀਆਂ ਦਾ ਹਥੈਸ਼ੀ ਆ ਤੇ ਉਸ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਨੂੰ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹ ਰੈਜ਼ੋਲੂਸ਼ਨ ਪਾਉਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਕਿ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਣਾ ਮੁਲਕ ਆਪਣੀ ਰਾਇ ਰੱਖਣ ਦਾ ਅਧਿ
ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣਾ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੇ ਅੱਗੇ ਕਿੱਦਾਂ ਰੱਖਾਂਗੇ ਸਿਰਫ ਇੱਕੋ ਇੱਕ ਤਰੀਕਾ ਹੈ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਆਪਣੀ ਮੈਂਡੇਟ ਇਕੱਠੀ ਕਰੋ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ 2020 ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਉਸ ਦਾ ਕਲੇਮ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾਏ ਐਟ ਲੀਸਟ ਜੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਨਹੀਂ ਪਤਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਟੇਬਲ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਇਹ ਚੀਜ਼ ਕਲੀਅਰ ਹੋਣੀ ਚਾਹੀਦੀ ਕਿ ਯੈਸ देयर इज अ डिस्प्यूट इन इंडिया नॉट ओनली कश्मीर खालिस्तान भी पंजाब दी भी डिस्प्यूट है और वो प्रेशराइज करन इंडिया नु के यूएन दी सुपरविजन दे बीच इथे रेफरेंडम करवाया जाए और इना लोका नु अपना किस दिन आ रहना है अपनी किस्मत दा फैसला ए लोग करन सो so, प्लीज सारेया नु अपील है और जिन्ने भी इथे डेलीगेशन तकरीबन होन ता सारे चले गए ने ਮੈਂ ਉਮੀਦ ਕਰਦਾ ਪਾਜੀ ਹੁਣੀ ਸ਼ਾਇਦ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਬਾਅਦ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੋਈ ਚਿੱਠੀ ਪੱਤਰ ਡਬਲਯੂਐਸਪੀ ਦੇ ਬਿਹਾਫ ਤੇ ਕਰਨਗੇ ਸੋ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਅਰਜ ਕਰੋ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸਾਡਾ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਹੈ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਇਸ ਨੂੰ ਉਹ ਯੂਐਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਸਪੋਰਟ ਕਰਨ ਔਰ ਜਿੰਨੇ ਵੀ ਸਾਡੇ ਸਿੱਖ ਭੈਣ ਭਰਾ ਨੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀ ਬ੍ਰਦਰ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਵੀ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਨੂੰ ਸਪੋਰਟ ਕਰਨ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਕੱਲੀ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਰਾਈਟ ਵਾਇਓਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਨਾਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਸਰਨਾ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਰਾਈਟ ਵਾਇਓਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਕਿਤੇ ਵੀ ਕਦੋਂ ਵੀ ਸਟਾਪ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾ ਸਕਦੀ ਹੈ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਕੀ ਫਿਰ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਮਸਲਾ ਖਤਮ ਹੋ ਜਾਣਾ ਆਜ਼ਾਦੀ ਦਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ 84 ਵਿੱਚ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਦਾ ਕਤਲੇਆਮ ਕੀਤਾ ਜੈਨੋਸਾਈਡ ਕੀਤੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਬੰਦਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਕੱਲ ਨੂੰ ਫਾਂਸੀ ਦੇ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਫਿਰ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਮਸਲਾ ਖਤਮ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਅਕਾਲ ਤਖਤ ਤੇ ਅਟੈਕ ਕੀਤਾ ਉੱਥੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹਜੇ ਵੀ ਬਰਾੜ ਬੈਠਾ ਹੈ ਕੱਲ ਨੂੰ ਬਰਾੜ ਦਾ ਟ੍ਰਾਇਲ ਚੱਲ ਪੈਂਦਾ ਬਰਾੜ ਖਤਮ ਬਰਾੜ ਨੂੰ ਸਜ਼ਾ ਹੋ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਕੀ ਤੁਹਾਡੀ ਇੰਡੀਪੈਂਡੈਂਸ ਦੀ ਲੜਾਈ ਖਤਮ ਇਹ ਨਹੀਂ ਖਤਮ ਹੋਣੀ ਸੋ ਲੜਾਈ ਤੁਹਾਡੀ ਇੰਡੀਪੈਂਡੈਂਸ ਦੀ ਆ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਰਾਈਟ ਇਸ਼ੂ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਆਉਣ ਵਾਲਾ ਅਹਿਮ ਪੁਆਇੰਟ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਗੱਲ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਯਾਦ ਰੱਖਣੀ ਚਾਹੀਦੀ ਹੈ ਸੈਲਫ ਡਿਟਰਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਤੇ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਡਿਸਕਸ਼ਨ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਉੱਥੇ ਇਹ ਵੀ ਹੋਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਆ ਸੈਲਫ ਡਿਟਰਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਲਾਗੂ ਕਿਦਾਂ ਕਰਦੇ ਨੇ ਉਹਦਾ ਇੱਕੋ ਇੱਕ ਹੱਲ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਸਮੇਂ ਡੈਮੋਕ੍ਰੈਟਿਕ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਦੇ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਨਾਨ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਵੀ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰੈਕੋਗਨਾਈਜ਼ ਹੈ ਬਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਡਮ ਤਾਂ ਹੈ ਹੀ ਸੋ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਹੀ ਸ਼ਬਦਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਮੈਂ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਕਰਦਾ ਸੋ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੇ ਸੁਣਿਆ ਔਰ ਉਮੀਦ ਕਰਦਾ ਭਾਜੀ ਹੁਣਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਭਈ ਜੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਦੇ ਜਿੰਨੇ ਵੀ ਨੁਮਾਇੰਦੇ ਆਏ ਸੀ ਜੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਵੀ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਸੈਲਫ ਡਿਟਰਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਪਤਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਪਤਾ ਜਨੀਵਾ ਕਨਵੈਨਸ਼ਨਸ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਸਾਈਨ ਕੀਤੀਆਂ ਸੋ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਕਿ ਜੇ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਨੇ 83000 ਤੋਂ ਵੱਧ ਸੈਕੰਡ ਵਰਲਡ ਵਾਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਕੰਟਰੀਆਂ ਲਈ ਸ਼ਹਾਦਤਾਂ ਦਿੱਤੀਆਂ ਸਾਡੇ ਫੌਜੀ ਸ਼ਹੀਦ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਯੂਰਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਵੀ ਫਰਜ਼ ਬਣਦਾ ਕਿ ਸਾਡੀ ਕੌਮ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇਹ ਦਰਦਨਾਕ ਇਹ ਇੱਕ ਹਾਣੀ ਆ ਜੋ ਜੋ ਸਾਡਾ ਇਤਿਹਾਸ ਆ ਇਸ ਦੇ ਬਿਹਾਫ ਤੇ ਜੋ ਸਾਡਾ ਪਹਿਲਾ ਰਾਜ ਸੀ ਸਿੱਖ ਰਾਜ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਕਾਇਮ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਇਹ ਯੂ ਐਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰੈਜ਼ੋਲੂਸ਼ਨ ਪਾਉਣ ਮੈਂ ਤਾਂ ਇਹੀ ਸਮਝਾਂਗਾ ਕਿ ਇਹੀ ਇੱਕ ਸੁਹਿਰਦ ਹਮਦਰਦੀ ਹੋਏਗੀ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਜਾਂ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀਆਂ ਨਾਲ ਜੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਤੇ ਜ਼ੁਲਮ ਹੋਇਆ ਕੱਲੀ ਵਾਇਓਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਨਾ ਕਰੋ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਰਾਈਟਸ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਨਾ ਕਰੋ ਇੰਡੀਪੈਂਡੈਂਸ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰੋ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਗੁਰੂ ਪਿਆਰੀ ਸਾਧ ਸੰਗ ਜੀ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਟਾਈਮ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੋ ਚੁੱਕਾ ਡੈਲੀਗੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਿੰਨੇ ਵੀ ਆਏ ਆ ਉਹਨਾਂ
ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਵੀ ਆ ਸਾਰੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਕੋਲ ਹੈਗੇ ਆ ਉੱਥੇ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਡਿਸੀਜਨ ਮੇਕਿੰਗ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਆ ਚਾਹੇ ਉਹ ਸਰਕਾਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੋਵੇ ਚਾਹੇ ਕਿਸੇ ਇੰਸਟੀਟਿਊਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੋਵੇ ਉਹ ਉਹ ਬਣਾਈ ਜਾਵੇ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਸਾਰੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਿੱਖ ਇਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਸ਼ਾਏ ਆ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਡੇ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀ ਭਰਾ ਵੀ ਆ ਸਾਰੇ ਹੋਰ ਵੀ ਤੇ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਤੇ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਹੈ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇਹ ਚਾਹੇ ਕਿ ਲੜਾਈ ਹੋਵੇ ਉਹ ਹਰੇਕ ਬੰਦਾ ਇਹ ਚਾਹੁੰਦਾ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਪੀਸਫੁਲੀ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਹੱਕ ਆ ਉਹ ਮਿਲਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਦੇਖੋ 1947 ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਸੀਂ ਪਾਰਟੀਸ਼ਨ ਹੋਏ ਪਾਰਟੀਸ਼ਨ ਹੋਣ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਹ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖਾਂ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਸਾਡਾ ਹੱਕ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆ ਉਹ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਹੋ ਤੇ ਅੱਜ ਅਸੀਂ ਹਿੰਦੁਸਤਾਨ ਤੋਂ ਇਹ ਗੱਲ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਦੱਸਣੀ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣਾ ਹੱਕ ਮੰਗਦੇ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਭੀਖ ਨਹੀਂ ਮੰਗਦੇ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਉਹ ਹੱਕ ਮਿਲਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਉਹ ਤਦੇ ਹੀ ਮਿਲਣਾ ਆ ਜੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਜੇ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਦਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਦੁੱਖ ਦਰਦ ਬੰਡਾਵਾਂਗੇ ਤੇ ਸਾਰੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹ ਦੱਸਾਂਗੇ ਕਿ ਹਾਂ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਆ ਵਿਤਕਰੇ ਹੋ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਆ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਅਨਿਆਏ ਹੋ ਰਿਹਾ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਿਹੱਤੇ ਬੱਚੇ ਮਾਰੇ ਜਾ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਜਤੀਮ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਜਿੰਨਾ ਚਿਰ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਹ ਸਾਰੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਪਣਾ ਦੁੱਖ ਡਿਕਲੇਅਰ ਕਰਕੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਦੱਸਦੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਚਿਰ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਆਪਣਾ ਘਰ ਖਾਲਸਤਾਨ ਨਹੀਂ ਮਿਲਣਾ ਮੈਂ ਟਾਈਮ ਨੂੰ ਦੇਖਦੇ ਹੋਏ ਹੋਰ ਵੀ ਗੱਲਾਂ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਸੀ ਪਰ ਨਹੀਂ ਆਓ ਗੱਜ ਕੇ ਫਤਿਹ ਬੁਲਾਈਏ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਆਈ ਮੀਨ ਥਿਸ ਜਸਟ ਰਿਮਾਈਂਡਸ ਅਸ ਔਨ ਥੈਟ ਡੇ ਵੈਨ ਵੀ ਐਕਚੁਅਲੀ ਰਿਸੀਵਡ ਅ ਲੈਟਰ ਫਰਮ ਜਥੇਦਾਰ ਜਗਤਾਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਹਵਾਰਾ ਵੇਰ ਹੀ ਸੈਡ ਥੈਟ ਇਨ 2015 देयर वाज अ रेजोल्यूशन पास्ड इन सरबत खालसा टू क्रिएट द वर्ल्ड सिख पार्लियामेंट and seven and eight of us decided to work to how to implement this and have a platform like this for every organization who's working for the freedom of our Sikh nation is actually got a platform where they can raise their voice to the international community i would like to thank you all today on behalf of each and every member the 150 members at the minute for the world sick parliament and the other associate members of old sikh parliament who's actually made this day a reality all of you are present here in spirit or in person you guys have actually proven one solid point here today how important is peace to human civilization all of you who were here we all know what's happening in southeast asia we all know how this so called largest democracy in the world has actually put hundreds and thousands of innocent people under the threat of a war which is expectedly going to be the most destructive war human race has ever seen to fulfill their fascist hindu agenda that's their only goal and obviously we as a sikh nation we all know and i'm not going to repeat so many of the points we have already witnessed enough damage enough persecution enough loss of our loved ones whether it be 1947 or 1984 or the early early 90s where this so called secular democracy actually showed its true color and murdered hundreds and thousands of the sikh in broad daylight our geographical nation which is east punjab that should have been an independent state ideally and will will it it will be god willing is under indian occupation at the minute we all understand that this war will pose a total destruction of our sikh homeland now obviously not to forget we have 100 plus holy shrines and historical significant places which are specially related to our sikh raj in the other part in, in the other punjab which is west punjab in the pakistan so any of these places they get decimated we will incur heavy loss any war that is forced upon our homeland could completely destroy our heritage and majority of our population which is remaining i urge all of you 
who are here today to unanimously pass this resolution that our community who has been a successful nation in the past and aspires to be a nation in the future should be kept out of this war at any cost. Also taking another step in the direction of peace, I would request you all to make sure that we abide by this resolution that all the indigenous people of Punjab and Kashmir which is occupied by India should actually be given the right opportunity to exercise their right of self-determination under 1966 covenants of the United Nations. This is our basic human right. This will obviously pave a way for the creation of the buffer state which will actually then resolve these issues forever. Just to sum up on this, we need to recognize one thing which people sometimes don't. We need to recognize that India is never going to accept and has already raised their reservations for this international covenants, if I'm not wrong. They do not agree to this right of self-determination covenant. And, you know, Mahatma Gandhi has been quoted by one of our speakers today. I would like you all to know what was his views about self-determination. This is very important. This is his words. I'm not just making this up. If every component part of the nation claims the right of self-determination for itself, there is no one nation, there is no independence. This is what he thinks about actually indigenous people who are trying to create their own nation already declining so the right of the indigenous people this explains why India has reservations again this article now we all know in Seas Ganj Gurdwara before the independence in 1935 Gandhi actually promised in his own words that you will actually get a state which you will control and you can actually enjoy the, the, the beauty of the independence. This, this is what he promised, but never delivered. So to sum, sum up this conference, I, I would definitely like to say who all we are here, you know, we are the ones who care for the peace. We have to work together, we've got no choice in solidarity to achieve. What we deserve is to live free in peace. At last, I would like to quote one of my favorite authors. His name is Ralph Waldo. The only person you are destined to become is the person you decide to be. This is what we need to decide. So let's all decide. We need to live free, live in peace, and have a nation. Thank you. Why would you come out? Um, um, Marpeet Singh, by the way, um, is, is the engine um, behind uh, the World Sec Parliament and uh, a, a bright star for the future. So um, thank you for everything that you've done to pull the event together um, and for those views on the issue at hand. I'm going to wrap up now with some draft resolutions. I should say, because of the shortage of time, I haven't been able to share some excellent written contributions that we've had from people who couldn't make it. Salma Yaqub, who is a patron of the Stop the War Coalition. Uh, Raina Nazir, founder of the British Kashmir Women Council. Robin Marsh, who is the Secretary General of the United Peace Federation. Colleen Hussain, who is a peace activist. A lot of people have contributed to this event. Um, we haven't been able to read. I've got all their written statements here and I'm happy to share them with anybody who cared to look at them. Um, so, the draft resolutions we've had, which we've circulated amongst a few of us, are as follows. Four of them. Number one, this conference calls on the international community led by the United Nations to tackle the warmongering voices that are promoting a war between nuclear-armed India and Pakistan. 
so that it is made clear that war is not an option to resolve the disputes between those states. Such a war risks catastrophic destruction in South Asia, with potentially tens of millions of lives being lost in the region, even in a limited nuclear exchange. Use of nuclear weapons that can annihilate civil civilian populations constitutes a crime against international law. And those in power must be made aware that they will be held accountable for any such atrocity in South Asia. Secondly, this conference notes that the Sikh nation's homeland in Punjab would be the likely theatre of war and that it is not a party to the Indo-Pakistan dispute. It is a key stakeholder in peace in the region. Its population and homeland must not be targeted or used to perpetrate a war which would be completely destructive to the Sikh national interest. The Sikhs must be consulted by all parties to the dispute, so as to ensure that damage to the Sikh populations and holy sites in Punjab, whether in East or West Punjab, is averted. Number three, this conference calls or urges India, Pakistan and China, as well as the United Nations, to urgently engage with all stakeholders in the disputes that affect the territories along the border between India and Pakistan, to help resolve conflicts peaceably and in accordance with international law. The aspirations of the peoples of Kashmir and Indian-controlled Punjab, where there are ongoing, legitimate, self-determination struggles, underpinned by Article 1 of the 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights must be respected if there is to be enduring peace in the region. Fourthly and lastly, this conference requests the UK government as a permanent member to raise the issues highlighted at this conference in the United Nations Security Council as an urgent priority. It owes a duty to the hundreds of thousands of diaspora Sikhs and Kashmiris living in the UK, all of whom have deep connections with their respective homelands, to prevent war and to seek peaceable, peaceable conflict resolution in South Asia. As a former colonial power whose chaotic departure resulted in the intractable conflicts still simmering some 70 years later, it also has the moral responsibility to intervene. So those conference were the draft resolutions. Um, may I put it to a show of hands to see if we can, we can agree on those? I believe we've got unanimity there. So, Bolei So Nihal! Wai Gurji Ka Khalsa, Wai Gurji Ki Fateh! We will share these resolutions not only amongst our own communities, we're going to share these resolutions with the states that surround Kashmir and Punjab. We're going to tell them that they have a responsibility to listen to the authentic indigenous people's viewpoint because they are the stakeholders who, whose views are going to lead to ultimate solution of those conflicts. We'll share it with the United Nations, we'll share it with the media, and thank you to the media organizations uh, who have been here today from uh, the Sikh media, from the Kashmiri media. Uh, we're really grateful for your contribution. Um, Joka Singh Ji, would you like to say a few words to, to wrap up? Ajo. Ajo, Ajo. Don't hit skin. Why Guru Ji Ka Khalsa, why Guru Ji Ki Fateh? Why Guru Ji Ka Khalsa, why Guru Ji Ki Fateh? Sare and the S Conference, the Vach Shamal Holi, Asi Sare Pranda Gabji, the Third Lotan Vadkardeha. और आप जी ਦੇ ਚਾਰਨਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੇਨਤੀ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਉਮੀਦ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆਪਾਂ ਮਸਲੇ ਤੇ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਕੀਤੀ ਆ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਪ੍ਰੈਕਟਿਸ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਿੱਦਾਂ ਲਿਆਉਣਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਾਂ ਹੱਲ ਕਿੱਦਾਂ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਨੌਜਵਾਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਬੇਨਤੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਪੜ੍ਹੇ ਲਿਖੇ ਹੋ ਭਾਸ਼ਾ ਬੋਲ ਸਕਦੇ ਹੋ ਲਿਖ ਸਕਦੇ ਹੋ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਹਰ ਮੁਲਕ ਤੱਕ ਆਪਣਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਮਸਲਾ ਆ ਪਹੁੰਚਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਆ ਹਰ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਬੈਸੀ ਤੱਕ ਆਪਣੀ ਗੱਲ ਪਹੁੰਚਣੀ ਚਾਹੀਦੀ ਹੈ ਖ
ਸਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਦੇ ਪੰਜ ਮੁਲਕ ਹੈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਅਸੀਂ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਵੀ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਆਉਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਸਮੇਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਲਿਆ ਵੀ ਜਾਵੇ ਤੇ ਇਸ ਇਹ ਤੋਂ ਬਿਨਾ ਆਪਣਾ ਗੁਜ਼ਾਰਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਇਹ ਤੋਂ ਬਿਨਾ ਆਪਣੇ ਮਸਲੇ ਦਾ ਹੱਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਘੱਟੋ ਘੱਟ ਆਪਣਾ ਮਸਲਾ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਦੇ ਪਲੇਟਫਾਰਮ ਤੇ ਇਹ ਹਾਈਲਾਈਟ ਤਾਂ ਹੋਵੇ ਉਹ ਦੁਗਾਂ ਹਰ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੋਣੀ ਆ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਆਪਾਂ ਸਾਰੇ ਰਲ ਮਿਲ ਕੇ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਕੋਈ ਇੱਕ ਸੰਸਥਾ ਦੇ ਵਸ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਤੇ ਮੀਡੀਆ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕਾਫੀ ਚਰਦੇ ਆਏ ਆ ਤੇ ਹੋਰ ਦੂਜੀਆਂ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀਆਂ ਜੋ ਕ੍ਰਿਸਚਨ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਮੁਸਲਮ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਹੋਰ ਵੀ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀਆਂ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਨੁਮਾਇੰਦੇ ਆਏ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਤਹਿ ਦਿਲ ਨੂੰ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਅੱਗੇ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਵੀ ਉਮੀਦ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਬੇਨਤੀ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਆਪਣਾ ਕੋਈ ਸੁਝਾਅ ਹੋਵੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਦੱਸੋ ਆਪਾਂ ਇਹਨੂੰ ਕਿਦਾਂ ਗਾਂ ਕਿਦਾਂ ਪ੍ਰੂਵ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਗਾਂ ਵਾਲੇ ਵਾਲੇ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਆ ਭਾਈ ਦੂਜੀ ਚੜ੍ਹਦੀ ਕਲਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਰੀਏ ਸੋ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਭਾਈ ਰਣਜੀਤ ਸਿੰਘ ਭਾਈ ਮਨਪ੍ਰੀਤ ਸਿੰਘ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਬੇਨਤ ਕੀਤੀ ਆ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਨੂੰ ਲਿਖਣ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਮੈਂ ਤਾਂ ਬਸ ਅੱਜ ਗੈਸਟ ਪੇਰਿੰਗ ਸੇ ਕੀਤੀ ਆ ਕਿ ਬਹਿ ਗਿਆ ਬਾਕੀ ਕੰਮ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੋਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੋ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਦਾਸ ਤਹਿ ਦਿਲ ਨੂੰ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਕਰਦਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਅਕਾਲ ਚੈਨਲ ਨੂੰ ਸਬਸਕ੍ਰਾਈਬ ਕਰੋ ਨਵੀਂ ਵੀਡੀਓਜ਼ ਦੀ ਨੋਟੀਫਿਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਬੈਲ ਆਈਕਨ ਨ